Good morning. I'm Councilmember Marion Barry, representing Ward 8, and chair of the Committee on Workforce and Community Affairs. Today is April 19, 2013, in room 120 of the historic John A. Wilson Building. The time is now 10.32, 10.35. Today the Committee has convened in order to conduct a public hearing, oversight hearing, for the Office of Veterans Affairs, Office of Latino Affairs, Office of Aging and Pacific Fowler, Commission on Aging and Latino Development, Office of Human Rights, Commission of Human Rights, and Office of Community Affairs to include the following. The Office of GLBT, Office of Women and Polit Policy Initiatives and Commission of Women, Office of Af African Affairs, Youth Advisory Council, Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Investment, Office of Religious Affairs. A fast-growing economy has allowed the mayor the opportunity to propose a budget when we as council members would not have had to address a budget gap. It allowed him to place additional funding in many significant ways. Let me uh, take time to explain the budget process because some people don't understand it or some people might have forgotten how it works. First of all, the D.C. government's budget for 2014 is over 10 billion, B I L L O N, 10 billion dollars. Six billion is from our own local funds, the rest of it is federal funds. So, what happens, the mayor sends the budget over to the council. Now, before that happens, A lot happens before that happens. The mayor is the only person in the District of Columbia that can submit a budget to the council. The council can change any and everything in that budget that it wants to because it has to pass an act. That act has to be passed by the mayor. In our case, because we're so convoluted, it has to go to the Congress and lay over for more than 30 days or has to catch up with the federal government budget. For the last three or four years, the federal government has not had a budget. Now, we read that again. The national government in the United States of America has not had a budget. You say, well, how does it operate? What has happened, it operates on what's called continuing resolutions. The Congress, the Council, I mean, the uh, Senate and the ha House <coughs> passes consider considerable amount of work on continuing resolutions. Mm -hmm. Most of the continuing resolutions keep spending for the national government at the same level it was the last year, in 2013, in terms of 14. Now it comes to us. I'm a political ally of the mayor. I work hard as I could to get him reelected, get him elected. Mm -hmm. And so my disagreement with some things in the mayor's budget has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with right and wrong, or my philosophy. Other members of the council have different philosophies about things. And so you'll see during my hearings, I'm going to propose to put additional monies in terms of our priorities with a $6 billion budget. These small agencies should have to suffer like this. The Office of Latino Affairs shouldn't have to not be able to make grants, and et cetera. The Office of Religious Affairs should not be able to not have programming. So everybody understands that when I make these criticisms, which I'm going to make them, and these analyses, I'm going to make them, not political, it's not personal, against Mayor Gray. I am a strong supporter of Mayor Gray and his administration. As in a democracy, I don't agree with everything that they do. I don't agree with everything that the council does. That's what democracy is all about. If we don't like that, uh, those of you who may not like that process, go get you a dictator. Or go to a totalitarian country and bring it here. Now, why am I talking about that? Because I get too many, I'm so tired of people saying, why you criticize the mayor? Why you do this? Why you do that? Why you do that? In every state in the nation, there's a legislature and an executive. 
The Supreme Court has ruled that the separation of power gives the legislature authority over those affairs, the Supreme Court, the courts over court affairs, and the executive over executive affairs. And so I think we have a responsibility as a government, we're a young government. We only been in business since 1975. I was uh, fortunate to be able to be on the first city council. I've had 31 years of service in this town. And so I wanted to put that in perspective because I do intend to add money. There's $100 million out there that the mayor thinks ought to go to Wall Street. Dr. Gunner thinks he ought to go to Wall Street, the chairman. But fortunately, there are seven of us on the council who don't agree with that, that we need to spend this money now. People are suffering. People are going to bed hungry at night. School kids are being uh, put out of school for things that are not beyond their control. We have the highest dropout rate in the country, the highest truancy rate. Give you an example. See, all this is synergistic. You can't take what we're doing in isolation. The truancy rates, for instance, at Baloo, and I love Baloo, Mr. Ranch doing a great thing, is 400 students are considered chronically truant out of 800. That's outrageous. That's almost criminal. We spend almost $700 million to keep mostly black people locked up. That's wrong. We need prevention. We need all these kind of things. So I'm not just a narrowly focused person. For 16 years I had the responsibility of trying to manage, and did manage very well, this D.C. government. Programs that were beneficial to people. I'm a people person. And I don't have any problem with Wall Street getting a portion of the money. But I'm not for Wall Street getting $100 million at the expense of people, at the expense of African-American businesses, at the expense of our seniors. You know, we have a 100 thousand seniors in this town and we're spending and a pitlin 30 million dollars a pitlin 30 million dollars a pitlin 30 million dollars I take some responsibility because I had the same kind of problems I wouldn't I wasn't enlightened then as I am now I voted for budgets on this council I shouldn't have voted for but enlightenment comes when it comes Enlightenment comes when it comes. So for all of you who are advocates, get ready. We, we're going we're gonna to really push this budget to the end. Now in terms of commissions, I'm not very happy about their pushing. Because the mayor points you, doesn't mean you shouldn't push for what you need. The mayor can't unpoint you. He cannot reappoint you. But you have some, have some dignity about yourself. If he... Re does not reappoint you because of your views on the budget and program, then something is wrong with him, not you. So get ready. This is going to be a, this is going to be a different kind of budget year than yeah. last year. I was watching Roots about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. How many of you have, how many of you all have seen Roots? That's great. You know, in terms of Chicken George and. <laughs> <laughs> and Lizzie and all those people. <laughs> but what it did for me was just to wake me up to a lot of things. You know, I couldn't not turn it off. I watched it the whole whole episode that they put together. And that was one factor that just sort of hit me very hard. The other thing which, which hit me was the violence in our town. It had been there to my feeling about it. And so all this comes together to make Marion Barry more aggressive, um, more stand-up, more humanitarian, more sensitive. The mayor has a, a difficult job. The way I did the budget is not the way he does it. I used to meet with the budget directors and department heads for a whole round of discussion at the beginning of the budget process. I know these budget cutters. They're cut, and nothing happens to them. If Dr. Gunner does not 
uh, recommend a budget uh, that's balanced. We can't do it. But within that, there's some other things. And I told Dr. Gandhi, get ready. I'm not going to take this uh, narrow-minded approach to spending our money. And so with that, The first agency is the Office of Community Affairs. Proposed FY 2014 budget is a piddling $2.3 million, which had a small decrease. Ain't that, ain't that something? This agency is already underfunded. And they're going to be cut $233,000. And so, fortunately, I'm, I'm going to have a a very narrow seven people on the council, the not, the not the chair, not the chairman. Is that better? Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to uh, call Steve Rodney. <laughs> no, uh, Steve Rodney will uh, testify on behalf of all the agencies. Then we go down each agency as we go. Let me say that I've had a, a great relationship with Mr. Cloud Day. Uh, we differed on a few things, but those are the things that the mayor differed on. And he, as a department head, he has a responsibility to reflect the mayor's views on that with, with, with oath. All right. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, under penalty of law, that the testimony you're about to give to this committee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you. It's crazy. Do you, do you, pardon me, do you have a statement? Do you have a statement? Let's have it. Welcome, Mr. Glade. And staff. I'm pleased to testify before you today on, on Mayor Gray's fiscal year 2014 budget and confidently share that the Office of Community Affairs uh, proposed fiscal year 2014 budget fully addresses the agency's funding needs. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, <coughs> Mayor Gray's um, 2014 budget submission focuses on three priorities, growing and diversifying the economy, educating our children, and preparing our workforce for a new economy and improving the quality of life of all residents. I'm pleased to report that for fiscal year 13, all of the community affairs offices are operating within their approved budgets and expect to close out the fiscal year in compliance with budget mandates. The Office of Community Affairs over the last 12 months has worked hard to respond to thousands of constituent requests, support district agencies in identifying and meeting citizen needs, engage the wide range of affinity groups we serve, and advance the mayor's priorities. I'm also really pleased to report to you, Mr. Chairman, on a non-budgetary issue um, that thanks to the diligent work of the Mayor's Office of Boards and Commissions, the Commission on African American Affairs has been nominated by the Mayor and is pending confirmation for the Council. I'm further pleased to note, Mr. Chairman, uh, as proposed in the, that there is a, a wide number of Ward 8 residents, um, including Charles Evans, uh, Absalom Jordan, Dr. Jesse Be Belmley, Reverend Anthony Motley and Patsy Flesher from Ward 8 who have been nominated for that commission. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the commission in advancing the work which you envisioned when you proposed the commission's creation. This concludes my formal testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. In terms of uh, overall relationships with other members of the government, what kind of specific thing are the agencies that you have under your point of view, what are some specific things they do collectively with the government? 
Well, collectively, all of the offices under community affairs have very distinct constituencies that they must respond to. Uh, Office of uh, Asian Affairs, uh, Asian Pacific Islander Affairs has a clear constituency. It must respond to the Office of Veterans Affairs uh, and all of the offices. I got that. I'm trying to get at programmatically what linkages in some instances do you have with agencies outside of the ones that are here that are affected by that? Give me an example. Well, for example, in the Office of Neighborhood Engagement, whenever there's a citizen uh, complaint or service request, we have to work with every agency across the district, uh, whether it's DDOT on uh, alley or tree issues, whether it's DPW on trash collection issues, whether it's zoning and planning on zoning issues. We actually, through our offices, reach how, out How does that work, though? Suppose you have a problem of a tree or trash in an alley that comes through community and great engagement. Mechanically, how does it work? Mechanically, we notify that agency directly. We say that a citizen has reported a problem. Who, who, we, who does that? The, they, all of our staff. I mean, it, it, the Office of Neighborhood Engagement has the primary responsibility for that. Um, so, as you well know, we have members who represent each ward. So, uh, given that we're two and a half years into our administration, most ANCs, in fact, all ANCs, civic and citizen associations, are aware of their ward contacts and reach out to them um, and report a problem. All of our uh, agency staff have specific um, representatives in those agencies that they reach out to. So, for example, in DDOT, we know who deals with um, tree issues in urban forestry. Who's that? In, in DDOT? Yes. Um, it, it was Aaron Rones who had dealt with that, and he's recently been promoted. Uh, I'm not sure of the person. I don't deal directly with that. The staff does. So I'm sure that when uh, who on your staff, uh, who in what agencies would be given the responsibility to deal with DDOT? All of the staff in the Office of Neighborhood Engagement have a direct relationship. You mean tell me all? Yeah, all of them. All the agencies here, they just call Terry Bellamy. Well, no, I call Terry Bellamy, but the Neighborhood Engagement staff have representatives. Do you call directly. the agencies? that come up to you in terms of your agencies to get something done in another agency. How does that work mechanically? Mechanically, all of the agencies that provide services to residents know that they are to respond to the Office of Neighborhood Engagement and the Office of Community Affairs. So there virtually is no agency that we don't have a day-to-day -day relationship. How many complaints do you have in 2012? In 2012, I would say we've had probably several thousand. How much? Probably several thousand. Several thousand? Several thousand. You keep records? Or we have a database it? that we use, so every time there's a call or an email that comes into the Office of Neighborhood Engagement, that case is entered into the database, and it's through that database tracked to its conclusion. We have asked these questions, questions and that you know how I feel personally you're doing all right. When I get nothing, with complaints about these constituents areas that have not been addressed. I've talked to uh, Jackie Ward about it. She's my person. I've talked to Dunn Watson, who's the one person out there. So I'm trying to find a way that the citizens can feel assured if they complain about something, that means it's about a complaint, but that's going to be addressed rather rapidly. Right. I'm surprised you haven't gotten more than a couple thousand complaints about things. Very surprised. Um, I think that we have a very high success rate of, of successfully resolving citizen requests and complaints. If people are not getting the service they need directly from their neighborhood engagement specialists, many, most citizens know how to elevate that complaint. That complaint can get elevated to me. And often, as you well know, Mr. Chairman, it will get elevated directly to the mayor. So all of us uh, in the Office of Community Affairs, and I would also submit that all of us in the District of Columbia government, the agencies as well, know that the last thing we want is for the mayor to be at a public event and someone can come up to him and say, um, I put in a complaint, I put in a service request, and it's not being well, have not made it, uh, attorneys, you know. Yes. They have been burned out. She was, she was just fighting mad. Right. She wouldn't stop talking because she felt deeply about this. I know that 
Uh, we followed up with her. She had, um, and it's, it's unfortunate that she was not aware of our office, but she had never reached out to us. Um, we have since followed up with her, and we are responding to her multiple agency needs. Exactly what I'm trying to get done, that you want to get done. Exactly. The citizens of the District of Columbia ought to know that is a vehicle. I know a lot about that case because Jackie Ward worked on that case. Mm -hmm. And work with her uh, got to a point where we couldn't do any more because she had not been in the loop mm -hmm. about housing at that point. So I, you know where I'm going with this. A absolutely. And so I'd like to get from you uh, on a probably monthly basis the complaint, uh, uh, things brought to your attention through various agencies, not just uh, neighborhood engagement. But if the Teen Affairs gets a complaint about something, um, how, how would that be handled? I think that Director Olivas, much like every other director in Community Affairs, has established direct relationships with most of the agencies who handle issues that are germane to her constituency. I don't get complaints from my directors often that agencies are not responding. If I do get those complaints, I will elevate that to the Deputy Chief of Staff, the Chief of Staff, and the Mayor directly. And I think that everyone, we're two and a half years into an administration. I think that most agency leadership knows Mayor Gray's values on responding quickly uh, and comprehensively to constituents. And I think that we all kind of live under that knowledge that um, the mayor expects us to respond and expects us to resolve. So, I mean, I will say in the beginning of the administration, it was a bumpy road, you know, getting that connectivity, but it's not anymore. Um, there's virtually no issue I can't or my staff can't bring to an agency's attention where we at a minimum don't get a quick response. We may not ultimately get the resolution that the resident requests, um, and sometimes it's an issue of law, sometimes it's an issue of regulation, sometimes it's an issue of policy. What is not allowed is that we not respond to people. I agree that that's the mayor's philosophy, no question about that. That's my philosophy. Uh, the issue here for me is how do you get the citizens in all of our wards to feel comfortable as to where you can go to get help. Now, some of the time, as you said, there's no way to get it done. It's just mm -hmm. either there's no law to help get it done, there's just, I don't know, money or something. But it's like public safety. And I talked to the mayor about this even during the campaign. Regardless of what you say about public safety, if the residents don't feel safe, then they're not safe. Right? Yes. Perception's a thousand percent. And both of us want this administration to succeed mightily as we go forward. Thank you. So that's my uh, line of questions in terms of that. And the two point nine million dollars that you have, how is it spent? I'm going to, um, the money is divided over the offices based pretty much on their structure. Uh, the largest okay. office uh, in community affairs, budgetarily, is Serve DC. Uh, as you well know, Serve DC has a large number, a good number, of federal grants, which um, they are released to the community. Um, and then second would be the Office of Neighborhood Engagement, which comprises the neighborhood engagement specialists that are divided among the wards. The remaining offices are relatively small offices, uh, most of them with two FTEs, and the money is divided up accordingly. Well, that's what I wanted to get at. You know, I, I, I think you do your own work. It's like making brick without straws in some instances. You make do with what you have. You reach out over here, reach out over there. And from my point of view, I'm going to add some money to this budget. I don't want to just throw it in, but I want to talk to you and other department heads about what's the best and most effective way to do it. Now, I don't want you all to get involved with this discussion about you know, sir, what the mayor says. You know better than that, don't you? <laughs> you, know, you know better than that. You know, but the, the one thing I would say, Mr. Chairman, is that even though some of these budget offices, these offices' budgets are small, we've learned to work and support uh, each other amazingly. You know, for example, when the D.C. Youth Advisory Council has to do a youth town hall, we don't leave them alone to recruit the young people to participate. We have 12 other offices. 
And so we ask Latino affairs and Asian and Pacific Islander affairs and African affairs uh, and women's policy um, to help promote that event. So normally where you would say you need a person that just does outreach because we do so many events, if each office supports each other, we find that we, we make up those gaps in, in really uh, amazing ways. I'm very proud to say that in the two and a half years that we've uh, been in office that every one of the 13 offices, every event, every activity, and every program that each of these offices has had has been amazingly well attended. Um, the uh, programs have been properly constructed because they've consulted each other. And I think that's the intent of having an Office of Community Affairs, that you can get these offices working together. If they were separate in individual offices, I think that you might argue that their budgets might need to be. But the way this office was designed is that we would support each other in everything that we do. I have no problem with it. I'm just saying that I'm going to find a way to have more money. Money's not the only thing, but just so much comes along. It's the best thing I know in sort of operating government. And so we'll be working. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't expect you to get in between a policy dispute between the mayor and this chair or this council. I absolutely and you know about it. You've been around <laughs> long enough. And I don't want to, I'm not going to ask you to do that. Just like I'm not going to ask the department head and, and public arena here, uh, what do you need more of? They'll do generally. But I'm going to ask the commission chair. I'll be tough on those. They have a responsibility to represent the constituents, like the Office of Asian. I think it's just awful that we don't have $30 million for our seniors. I'm proposing uh, a major increase in homebound meals, those kind of things I'm going to push. And I'm positive I got the support of my committee, and I got the support of the council. I don't have to put a chair on some things, but I don't care about that. You know what I mean? Thank you. Any, any final statements you want to make? No, just, you know, just a final reiteration that I'm very proud of the leadership that comprised the Office of Community Affairs. Uh, I think given uh, a number of things, the challenges of working with very diverse and demanding constituencies, um, the, the size and, 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 and scope of their offices and budgets, that they have just done an incredible job of not only serving the mayor, but serving their constituencies and the residents of the District of Columbia. So, thank you, Mr. I Chairman. agree with you on that. I'm sure I'm going to find some money. <laughs> what, what, is, what is that? Uh, also, I'm going to have a major blowout on all returning citizens. The chairman put it over in the judiciary where it shouldn't be uh, because that's where the problems are. And so, We'll be talking about that too. We like it the way it was in terms of that. I'm sorry. Mr. Kim was correcting me that it's in part of correction, which is part of the judiciary, so he knows better than that. All right? <laughs> Thank you very right. much. Thank you, sir. You know better than that. All right, let's move on. The first office is the Office of African Affairs and Commission on African Affairs. <coughs> Let me just say that I have a long personal interest in Africa. In 1979, and I've been brainwashed like everybody else, that all that was in Africa was heathens and, and Tarzans and all this kind of stuff. But it's true now, I'm going to tell you. That's what we've been brainwashed with. I was. A lot of us were. And because I was involved in the civil rights movement, where a lot of things that we did benefited my knowledge of Africa, our ancestral homeland. Now, a lot of black folks don't consider Africa our ancestral homeland. I do. And most blacks who don't consider that, you ought to go 
town for a good visit, see what's going on. I remember my first visit to Senegal, 1979, in April and May of that year. Sit down. Mm. April and May of that year. And my wife, Effie, and a small delegation went to the car and got off the plane. We were greeted with drummers, at least two or three different drumming groups, a red carpet, etc. So since I had not been to Africa, and I got off of the plane, went down the uh, steps, I bowed down and kissed the ground <laughs> of my ancestral homeland. And I'm going to do it. And so as a result of that, I've been to at least 20, 27 African countries. Uh, I've been to uh, a number of countries, Nigeria in particular, at the presidential inauguration. I have friends in all those countries. I am an honorary Igbo chief. No, all right. From Nigeria. <laughs> That's right. So I'm just giving you my pedigree because the Washington Post ain't going to tell you that. All right? And so ancestrally, I, I love what's happening. I have connected it. I don't like some of the things that have happened in Africa. I don't like some of the dictators that have murdered our people or their people. I don't like the totalitarian nature of some of those. But I love Africa and and various, I think it's about 50, 49, 50 states below the Sahara. They say I'm planning now to work on a trip sometime this fall, so I'll be talking to uh, members of the African Commission and other places to go. I, uh, one of my most traumatic experiences when I went to Senegal was to go to Glory Island where our ancestors went out the door of no return. When you go and you don't know where you're going, and you won't come back from that. And that was a very moving experience for me. And one of the other moving experiences I had in August of 06, when Mayor Williams took a delegation to South Africa. And we had a chance to visit Robin Island when Nelson Mandela had been in prison for a long, long time. We saw what brutality there had been there, for instance. They had the political prisoners out crushing limestone. And limestone is very reflective of light. And many of those prisoners went blind because of that condition. And Mayor Williams and I ended up at Nelson Mandela's cell. We both cried about the inhumanity of some people against our people. But the good news is that Nelson Mandela, as you very well know, went from prison to president. All of us ought to be proud of that situation. He didn't come back better. Should have. I think he should have, but he didn't. And he led the ANC. His health is not as well as it ought to be now. We ought to pray for him and all the people around him who are doing that. I give you this history because I've learned long ago if the loneliness, the lion tells the story, and I win, he'll always be king of the jungle. As long as the cowboys tell the story about Native Americans, they'll always be victorious. The only truth they have told uh, was about Custer, a little big horn, where the, uh, I think it was Sid Bull led the efforts to wipe him out. That's a true story. Now, why am I doing all this? Because I have a responsibility, not as just a councilman, but to help educate people about the history of myself personally and about our, our, our America. With that being said, let me see. Louis George, Vice Chair, Malcolm Affairs. Jimmy King Gonka, Hassan Conte, and Eureka Huggins. Welcome. Um, George first. Good morning, Councilman Mayor. You have a print statement, or you just you don't have to have one. Do you have one? 
a printed statement. A statement. Oh, I have. Okay. All right, proceed. Good morning, Council Marion Berry, Chairperson of the Committee on Workforce and Community Affairs. My name is Lloyd Rosa George, and at present I am the co vice chair and former chair for the Commission on African Affairs, COAA, where I also serve on the subcommittee for public safety. This morning I'm presenting my testimony in my capacity as a commissioner of the COAA and in my capacity as a practicing immigration attorney and advocate for immigrant rights within the district and beyond. From my unique vantage point as a civically engaged practitioner and immigrant advocate, I've been able to observe and work in the thick of the African diaspora constituency inside the Beltway for the last decade. To be sure, the African population within the district is dynamic, rapidly growing, diverse, and ripe for positively contributing to the distinct economic, cultural, and academic mosaic that is Washington, D.C., our one city. Yet and still, the African in the city, the district to be exact, is a relatively underrepresented and underserviced constituent. As my fellow witnesses will attest with raw data, although the African population in the district is presently expanding at an unprecedented pace, we are encountering the conundrum of having inefficient, underfunded, and or simply non-existent resources to properly service the unique needs and challenges of the subset, subset of the district's population. To be exact, the Commission was able to ascertain rather gaping holes in both the access to and outreach by many of the public services available to the general population within the district. These services in question include, but are not limited to, health care, housing, language access, cultural awareness, education, small business, and public safety matters. To be more specific, as a part of the Public Safety Subcommittee within the COAA, I can assure you that some of these holes, if left unattended, could result in a more imperfect union for all in the mayor's one city. What are some of these holes, you ask? Well, to provide a simple snapshot of just one area of need, within the purview of the COAA's Public Safety Committee's research and review, it was noted that within the district, there is no African MPD liaison. This is despite the fact that there is a Latino, Asian, and LGBT liaison, all of whom are appropriately created to bridge, were appropriately created to bridge the gaps between local law enforcement officials and the unique needs of the various communities they serve. There has been no organized outreach effort to introduce and or educate the MPD, FEMS, or HCMA into the African community. Aside from only recently providing certain public service documents in both French and Amharic, there have been no concerted efforts to educate the African community on emergency evacuation protocols, basic civil rights and protections under the law if one is ever the victim, witness, and or accused party to a crime or the dissemination of information on simple fire safety standards. Moreover, there does not appear to be any significant and or impactful representation of Africans and or recruit efforts targeting Africans to join the MPD and FEMS. Lastly, despite the fact that many of the Africans within the district are immigrants, there is no centralized community outlet for which to provide accurate, sound, and competent immigration information, counsel, and or resources. Rather, Africans within the district must avail themselves of the resources provided by various legal service providers that often cater primarily to the Latino constituents and their unique needs. As the Mayor's Office on African Affairs objective is to ensure access and improve the quality of life for the district's diverse African immigrant community, it then follows that the OAA would and should be the office that would attend to providing and or organizing remedying solutions to the above listed public safety issues as it pertains to Africans within the district. Yet and still, the OAA with its two-person staff, limited budget that barely covers personnel costs, and where it functions as an activity under the appropriation title within the Office of Community Affairs Program, rather than as an independent agency with its own budget codes and grant-making authority, the OAA simply cannot effectively and efficiently support the growing needs, issues, complexities, and contributions of the African community in and to the district. you wind down a little bit uh, so I'll have a chance to answer? It's been a minute and a half over, so. Okay. Um, we appreciate your testimony. Thank we got you. got a time schedule this one. To date, the OAA has proved itself to be judicious stewards with what it has been given. However, the time has come to reconsider the facts on the ground. Africans in the district are here. We're growing in number and impact. And as both community members and business owners, our dollars help fuel the local economy and local government. In turn, 
It is democracy in action that must ensure that the local government consider and provide the OAA with the means to service the African community. Thank you. Thank you very, very much in terms of this presentation. It's exactly what I need to be able to move forward in my question. Now, could you give me some examples of what money could do, how you would uh, coordinate all the immigration services in terms of this information? How can we increase the access to health care and those things you talked about? Well, I guess specific to immigration at present, there are various legal service providers within the city, um, most of whom are supported directly by uh, the office, office of Latino Affairs. And so for that reason, what support that they do get from, the, from OLA would be more so catered and narrowed towards the Latino immigrant constituents. What do we do to change it? How would you change it? Well, um, if it's too premature to, uh, well, there is no legal service provider that caters directly to African immigrants. In the so city. what would you suggest we do? So to start that off, it, perhaps a division within OAA that would be able to at least be a central uh, feeding or resting spot for information. So you, you have a friend here. You have somebody who's a big vision person. So you should ask for what you think would be adequate. And don't fear that I'm not going to do all I can. Give an example. I'm going to ensure, I'm going to say to you right now, that the Metropolitan Police Department will have a nail sign right here. I'm going to get that done today. If I don't get it done, yeah, we're going to raise hell about it. It's not fair. So, do you th so one idea you have is to have a legal uh, section in OLA, OA, to uh, handle these kind of things? Well, at least to have a central point where information could be appropriately, uh, could be centralized. As well, I'm, I'm probably thinking it ought to be in the office itself. I'm putting money into it for staff and for other things to do. I said earlier, this is a billion bud budget is ridiculous. So I appreciate your push on this. And before I make a profound decision, about how much money and where I'm going to put it and recommend it to the committee. I'll consult with you all about, about that. I want to thank you for your service. Were you born in the United States or born in Africa? I was born in France. In France? Where were your parents from? What country? My father's from Guinea-Bissau, West Africa, and my mom's from Mozambique, East Africa. I've been to Mozambique. Excellent. And I have a friend uh, who's in the Côte d'Ivoire right now with the president. He, he was uh, one of the lawyer people who stayed with the incoming president. They were holed up in a hotel for about six months until they bombed the dictator out. And so, thank you. Thank you. All right. Julianne Kegandi. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Chairman. Uh, did you? I do have a copy of uh, my testimony. If you want. Are we born in the United States or Africa? In Uganda, Uganda. East Africa. I uh, I've been in Uganda too. It's the most beautiful country on the continent. <laughs> uh, I, I went right out there. Idi Amin and went out of there. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's more to Uganda than Idi Amin, but <laughs> that's another conversation. He, he's gone. Thank God. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Good morning, Chairman Barry and committee and staff members. My name is Julian Kiganda, and I'm here today to testify on behalf of the Office of African Affairs. I come to you in the capacity of a community organizer, an entrepreneur, and a cultural performing artist. But none of these titles defines me more than my African heritage. As a native-born Ugandan and president of African Diaspora for Change, I have a passion for and commitment to the work I do to educate and empower African immigrants and the broader African diaspora through culture, dialogue, and advocacy. Over the past four years, I have worked closely with the Office on African Affairs on various programs, including partnering with the Office on every DC African Festival since 2010. As the mayor's title of his FY14 budget proposal titled Investing in Tomorrow suggests, it makes good business sense to increase your investment in a community that is a major contributor to the district's economic engine and cultural and social fabric, 
as well as the fastest growing immigrant group in Washington, D.C. It has been estimated that there are approximately 16,000 Africans living in D.C., which is likely a gross undercount due to the various factors that make it difficult to provide accurate numbers for the African immigrant population in general. <coughs> However, given increased funding, staffing, and resources, the OAA can provide even greater value and more robust programs and services to the rapidly growing African community in the district. In the same way that the Office on Latino Affairs, OLA, and the Office on Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs, OAPIA, have been given the authority to grant funds to their respective community serving organizations, so too should the Office on African Affairs be given the same authority. I would like to see the current disparities in operations and funding addressed in a way that provides for much needed resources, autonomy, and increased capacity in the OAA. To be more specific, in FY13, the Office of Latino Affairs received funding of almost $2.9 million, and the Office of Asian Pacific Islander Affairs received $780,000. In the same year, the OAA's budget was a mere $200,000, equaling only 7% that of OLA's and 26% that of the OAIPA's budgets. This amount is just enough for two full-time staff, but nowhere near enough to meet the growing and very diverse needs of an African population that has made and continues to make major contributions to this city. As just one example, my organization hosts 95% of our events and community initiatives in the district and will benefit from the OAA's capacity to provide grants in order to continue serving our community. We thank you in advance for being a catalyst for further empowering African immigrants in the District of Columbia to be full participants in contributing to the social, cultural, and economic fabric that makes the city so vibrant. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. You can tell the 16,000 undercounted Africans mm -hmm. that help is on the way right now and resources on the way. What are some of the things you think we can do resource-wise in terms of what I think kind of grants we, can we make to what kind of organizations, et cetera? Right. There are quite a number of African-serving organizations in the district, mine being one of them. Um, as an example, we are in the process of partnering with Catholic Charities to host immigration workshops around the city. Um, because of limited capacity, we can only do so much. But if we were given additional funding, we could expand that and actually be an extension of the work that the OAA does. And the number you have in mind? Uh, in terms of funding? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You'll clap on that. I don't mind. <laughs> you know, so, um, everyone here, like my colleagues do, <laughs> but you can't say anything, can't do anything. I don't want to put it that way. So, Chairman, I, uh, I took the numbers um, based on the budgets for the Latino Affairs and Asian Pacific Islanders and the numbers, the estimated numbers of those communities in the district. So um, based on that amount, um, Latinos in D.C. get an average of $45.87. Yeah, also Latino Affairs are underfunded too. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate why you're doing this this way, but they are very really right. underfunded. Well, this is this was just a very simple way for me well, to break yeah, down what I, appreciate it. I think would. Um, and then Asian Pacific Islanders, they they have about thirty four dollars per person. Um, Africans in D.C. about twelve dollars and fifty cents per person. So if we were to increase the budget and put it on par with the per person amount that the Office in Pacific Islanders um, gets, that would be about. Uh, an increase of to, to a budget of 544000 and if it was on par with the Latino affairs, that would mean an increase to a budget of $732,800. Okay. I'm going to do more than that. So good, Thank you. Thank you. a good guy to me. Good guy. What do you do professionally? Professionally, I have a marketing and branding firm. Oh, okay. And we work with culturally diverse audiences. And so What's the name of it? You put it out on television. <laughs> <laughs> the name of my company is Vibrant Design Group. Vibrant. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much. Let me just say again, I appreciate all these testimonies. And what happens in, in, in oppressed or uh, communities that have not been recognized, you have to be careful that you don't become like part of that situation. That's just a sociological way. But uh, thank you so much. Okay. Hassan Conte. Yes, ma'am. Welcome.
you know who I am. Where are you from? Senegal. Senegal. Yes. Senegal, West Africa. Not everybody wants to say, I don't know where I know. You know, because you don't be a lot of time. A lot of time. Lots of time. Uh, my name is Hassan Kohini. I think I'm probably be going to West Africa in the late summer. Uh, oh, so I Make sure you take me with you. You got any I, money? I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I'm no, you're leaving me behind. I don't want to leave you behind. Okay? All right. All right. Uh, I am the director and founder of Kankuram West African Dance Company. And I've been around this city for 30 years. And right now, how I end here in this table, I went to the African Fair because I've been knocking everybody's door in this building. Nobody answered. So I end going there. That's the way I end in this table. Okay. Now, how, how are you financial operations now? My operation? Yeah. From the community? Community? Yes. And we get, once in a while, we get some funding from the Art Commission. Okay. I've been around for 30 years. You know, I do that. You come to me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but my problem is, I will not want to move to War 9, Merida. No, 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 no. That's why it's coming. Yeah, I don't want to So, we got to get the, I got to get an answer today. 30 years in this city. Go from way back to your mayor days with your summer program and performing every agency in this city all the way to the White House. The what we know is the one with Bush. Everybody know it. Say it around the world. We represent Washington, D.C. internationally. My friends, I never applied for any summer job students. Oh, we still do that. We do after school program. We do a lot of things. No, no, no. I have to do we have to get some students and get some money for that. Well, uh, no, wait a minute. They can change. I, I take it. Your years is different than this year. Oh, I know. I know. But at the same time, my problem is every three years we move to place to place. And I know the permanent place to save more children in this city and do more education program and do it because we take this case internationally. But right now, we're homeless. I was in Randolph Recreation Center for the last five years. They shut that building down. Now we outside. We are going to go. You tell me. Any places I go. We talk about it. We'll get, we'll, get, we'll get you a place. I need a place. No question about that. I'm the only one left. You know, Northern Laws is part. Sure did. That's awful. I'm the only one left in the city with African culture. So somebody has to help. And you're the only one can do it. Because you've always been the community people. That's why I'm here. I can be, I'm not knocking anybody's door. I talked to your office three days, three weeks ago in Southeast. May we got to keep this organization in this city because we cannot afford to have international city like this and we just keep moving out. One of the good things that are happening, the mayor's supplemental budget is at the council. I'm trying to get the chairman not to be crazy about it and let it go through as a separate budget. Otherwise, we'll be in January before we get that money. So I'm going to push very hard to have a separate track. I'm going to push very hard. I'm going to put money in the supplemental. So you can have... Well, remember the one you opened for then. We're almost in it, in downtown, behind Last Bird. Right. You remember that building? We all was there, running all the program you created. And now we just sit here. You got it. Ain't nothing going on. What I'm is that I intend to move forthwith. That's an eagle turn. Thank you. Forthwith. I really appreciate forthwith.
Tennessee Air Force left. So uh, thank you for that. This, we have another outstanding person. Hmm. Erika Huggins. Yes. Witness. Good morning, Councilman What do you Perry? do professionally? I do a number of things. I wear several hats. I am the uh, co-founder of the African Diaspora Ancestral Commemoration Institute, ADASI, which was founded to dedicate the commemoration of our ancestors who perished during slavery. And it was a child of Conqueron, born out of the Conqueron Institution. Great. Uh, anyway, Councilman Berry, first of all, I want to thank you. Are you African? Of okay. course. We're all Africans. I don't know. All of <laughs> now, you know I know that. I'm talking was, about it. I was born in Canada, grew up in New York, but Africa is where my heart and my spirit is. Yes. Thank right. you. I first of all want to thank you for always being a champion for the African cultural community, Marion Barry. We appreciate you. I am here today to really express my concerns about the erosion that is taking place in the African cultural community, particularly institutions such as Conqueron, West African Dance Company, and African Heritage Dancers and Drummers, who were recently forced to vacate their space where they have been serving this community, especially the youth, collectively for over 80 years. They have been serving generations, at least three generations within this city. Their outstanding educational cultural programming is known around this country and around this world. We know for a fact that the, a couple of things, the rapid pace of redevelopment and gentrification in the District of Columbia, which is great for tax revenues, but it has really seriously not been kind to arts organization, especially institutions like uh, Conqueron and African Heritage. That, in addition to the economic crisis, which has crippled just about every one of us, has really crippled these institutions. They're hemorrhaging. They're really on life support. As we did research to find out where can these institutions go to address this dilemma, what we found out was that the Office of on Hispanic Affairs, the Office on Asian Affairs, do offer technical assistance grants to those communities, which we applaud. We applaud that. But we were shocked to find out that the Office on African Affairs couldn't do the same. They have no grant-making authority. So we are here to really address this issue of fairness and equity. We are appealing to your sense of fairness and because you have always been a champion for the African, American, the African cultural institutions, to number one, work with us like Baba Hassan to help us find an appropriate space in the District of Columbia where we belong, and number two, to allow the Office on African Affairs grant them grant-making authority so that on par with the other offices as well, so that they too can provide technical assistance grants so that these institutions can grow, so that they can deal with the issue of heritage preservation and serve the community. We are not newcomers to this district, Marion Barry, as you know that we've been here for generations. The, the, the members and families of, of African heritage and Conqueron are not just students and homemakers, they're entrepreneurs, they're teachers, they're professors. We all contribute not only to the cultural enrichment of the city, but also to the intellectual capacity and also to the economic base through our tax dollars. So we appeal to you as the mayor is launching this major one city initiative, let us make certain that all of the ethnic groups are well represented. And finally, in closing, I just want to say that this week we celebrated 150th anniversary of the emancipation of slavery in the District of Columbia. Let us work together to honor the memory of those ancestors and do the right thing. I thank you very much. As I said earlier, I intend to do something about all of that. We thank you. I can tell you right now, I'm going to recommend grant making authority to the office. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to increase the amount of money that will be available for grants and technical assistance and all those things. We thank now, you. Now, I'm going to need you all <coughs> to fight with me on that. Cool. Yeah, we're going to fight with you. Hey, Bob, oh, no, no. I don't agree with that. The chairman doesn't agree with that. So we're going we're gonna to earn a lot of money up to get the money to people and not to Wall Street. So thank you all very, very much. Thank, thank you, Thank, you, thank uh, you very much. I'm going to buy Alvin, Calvin, to get him some money to keep the doors open. 
we develop as it develop, we did all we could do. And the day he was about to move, he called me. And I just felt so, so, so sad, so bad about it. All right, let's move on.
when only needs to work to the most useful corridor to save. African entrepreneurs represent a strong linkage for DC businesses to export to fast growing markets in Africa as well as establish growing, progress, growing business presence on the continent. In light of education and, and earning, African immigrants reach very high education attainment, but yet the unemployment rate in our community is very alarming. These unemployment patterns and the failure to utilize highly skilled African immigrants contribute to a fastest growing phenomenon known as brain race which is defined as the chronic unemployment of highly educated people and scared group of people depriving local economies of very much needed tax revenues and skilled labor. African immigrants generally report very, African immigrants generally report simply have status compared to other immigrant groups but face many challenges complicated by language barriers, country stigma stereotype. Just an example, but according to the American Community Survey, 26.2% of African immigrants here in the district lack, lack health insurance. And as you all know, lack, the lack of insurance delay, um, causes delay in detecting diseases and preventing, detecting preventing diseases and contribute to uh, a rise in health care costs. According to our very own district, of, district Department of Health, all African women 40 years and older, 44% indicated they never had a mammogram. And among those 18 years or older, 34% never had a pap smear, a pap smear test. More importantly, sir, the Kaiser Family Foundation assessment that there are no precise national data on HIV AIDS on African immigrants should be cause, should be a great cause of concern for the district. These challenges raise the importance of a strong and vibrant office of African affairs in order to partner with agencies and the community on workforce and community effort to address the growing public policy needs of African immigrants in the district. In closing, African immigrants contribute to every aspect of life in the district, including cultural, economic, and educational. We are students, we are parents, we are doctors and homeowners, even future council members. I like that. I bet you. <laughs> in my research, I put forth several policy recommendations to help the district address these challenges, including investing in resources for culturally targeted outreach and educational program, investing in African immigrant workforce development to address borders, and finally supporting a strong and vibrant office in African affairs. These, the details of these investments are far greater in terms of revenues, strong community and skilled uh, skill workforce. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. This concludes my remarks, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Yes, we had a lot of good information now. Before that, as I said earlier, you give me more insight on where I can put this money. I'm going to put some money in the opportunity. I mean, the uh, after affairs and you know too. But uh, I really appreciate this. Let me ask you this: Are there any? Uh, I know they probably are. Are there any one or two organizations that? Uh, represent the cross section of Africans here. Well, the Ethiopian have a uh, economic Ethiopian culture center to mothers. <coughs> what I like for you all to do is find a way to get everybody who's doing anything for the African community in leadership together. I want to meet with them and, and push hard to be more cohesive about this. I know how it works down here. Speaking well, get the oil. So I'll be talking all to you about that. All right, next. <coughs> Good, morning, Curtis. Good morning, Councilman Barry and concerned citizens. My name is Lydia Curtis, and I'm here to express to the panel why the Office on African Affairs budget should be increased. <coughs> Even though I was born in the United States, I am a part of the African diaf diaspora, and my identity as an African is crucial to my well-being. It is important that people like me be able to find linkages with Africans born on the continent, and the Office on African Affairs does this. Their small staff brings people together from across the continent and the diaspora to dialogue on important issues such as education, 
come together in job circles that help people find work, youth and elderly concerns, the adjustment needs of the new immigrant, small business development, culture, and more. But they need the ability to do even more. They need the ability, for example, to sponsor and support youth groups doing good work in the community around targeted issues and sponsor exchange programs going to Africa. But more importantly, the Office on African Affairs needs the ability to support the preservation of African culture. For the past six months, three African Center institutions have lost their space in the District of Columbia and have had to either cut back or stop their operations. The Multimedia Training Institute that trains DC youth in filmmaking, the African Heritage Drummers and Dancers, and my organization, the Conqueror West African Dance Company. I see these closures as examples of the erosion of the richness and vibrancy of the African community. We can stop this erosion by using the budget surplus we have to increase the Office on African Affairs budget or give the office grant making authority to help small community-based organizations like Conqueror. I've been a member of the Conqueror community class for 21 years. I reconnected with the continent of my ancestors by learning the dances, songs, and rhythms of Senegal, Mali, and Guinea. I cannot overstate the importance of having that connection. We lost our roots on some of our folkways during the transatlantic slave trade. So institutions like Conqueron and others like Adasi and the African Heritage Drummers and Dancers build bridges back to that culture. Organizations like the Multimedia Training Institute teach our youth how to document and preserve our heritage. The District of Columbia cannot afford to lose the, these important gifts. Therefore, I implore this panel to increase the budget for the Office of African Affairs so that it can fully meet the needs of its constituents. I further state that the Office of African, Office of African Affairs should be given grant-making authority and additional funds to provide capacity building grants to organizations like Conqueron and also provide a central art space where black arts and culture can thrive. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. I love to have on that. That's important. Ms. Curry, thank you thank so you. much for coming. Thank you, sir. And to you for pointing out things that this committee wants to do. Uh, I said earlier, I'm going to recommend, and I'm sure to pass, we're making authority to the office. That's the first thing. Secondly, I'm going to increase the resources. What's wrong with this mic? I'm talking about. What's wrong with this mic? I'm at, I mentioned people here. What can we do about this mic? People out there, can you hear me? I'm trying to get this done. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Why are you do this area? <laughs> Uh, and I say, oh my God. <laughs> you know, those who know me know I'm persistent on things. I said earlier, Ms. Curtis, I intend to uh, recommend that we get a pass. Grant making authority for the office. We're going to put into the 14 budget a considerable amount of money. I'm going to take the supplemental budget and put recommendation. And what I want you all to do, once I do this, and you find these council members who don't support it, get on them about it, okay. including the chairman. Okay. You got to push hard to get this done. Can yes. I get that commitment? Yes. Yeah, okay. You can make that commitment. <laughs> okay. Samuel. Yeah, good morning, uh, Chairman Barry. Um, my name is Samuel Adelusi. I'm a resident of the District of Columbia. I started residing in the city in 1989. Shortly thereafter, I joined the WDCU mentor program to mentor students at Malcolm X Elementary School in Southeast. Um, I'm here today as a resident of DC uh, and a first generation African immigrant who appreciates and loves the District of Columbia. I know that uh, the work that uh, Mayor Barry has done when he was a mayor uh, of the city in, uh, you know, 
uh, focusing and uh, encouraging and leveraging the uh, African community uh, in the District of Columbia. Of course, um, um, there was a Commission on African Affairs in the past, but the idea of having a strong and viable, sustainable Office of African Affairs in our beloved city <coughs> is an idea whose time has not only come, but should have happened yesterday. Uh, I say this with due respect to our Latinos and Asian brothers, but that a strong and viable DCOA will not diminish any other community, but will strengthen all of us in this city. Uh, in this city, I mean, indeed in the Washington metropolitan areas, African immigrants are the most educated uh, you know, immigrants. However, whenever they arrive in, the, in our city, they have no resources to access the services provided by the city. The main reason for the lack of resources is primarily due to language barriers and a lack of strong and viable entity, as the DC Office of African Affairs, to help drive, and I'm quoting from the mission statement of the Office of Latin Affairs now, access to a full range of human services, health, education, housing, economic development, and employment opportunities for our African communities. Now, if you look at the uh, mission statement for I'm skipping to page two of my you know, presentation now. It says OAA provides constituent services and information to the African communities through programmatic activities and outreach materials. Programmatic activity sounds nice on paper, but it doesn't have any teeth to it. It's not backed by you know, finances, it's not backed by you know, FTEs. I'm sorry, FTEs is full-time equivalent. If you look at the FTEs for DC Office of African Affairs, it's only two. Is remained unchanged since 2012 up to 2014. Nothing has changed. If you look at the Office of Latino Affairs, when it started, the actual budget for the FTEs was 8.1. If you look at it in 2013, it's increased to 10. Now, in 2014, it's 10. I mean, I, I think these are the kind of things that the, you know, this office, I mean, this committee should look at and actually work hard to increase that and make you know, Office of African Affairs stronger viable and give it a grant making authority so that it can actually help provide full services, full range of services. And my recommendation is simple. Um, I'm not, you know, um, advocating too much, you know, uh, for uh, DCOA, but under that grant making authority, maybe what we, are look, what we are looking for is an African community center where you will have a full range of, uh, you know, services. One of them will be health provider. Start by volunteers, doctor from some of these countries in Africa where they can speak native language to people who want to come in and get you know, access to health. Another one is providing immigration counseling at the same center. So this will be like a whole house in one place for everybody who want to come from Africa. For example, I asked for a Yoruba interpreter for a client of mine the other day. Guess what? They sent us a Latino interpreter. And we were sitting down there looking for the Yoruba interpreter, we couldn't find any. Mm -hmm. But this is what we are looking for, to have a, you know, a, a full service community center where people can go to. You can actually have some of these uh, Kankuran um, dance companies, they can actually also use that same African community center as a place to practice, as a place to host events, and that will actually make life easy for everybody. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, thank, I'm sorry, I'm used to talking to judges. Let me uh, just say and reiterate how serious I am okay. about doing something concretely okay. about the situation. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to consult with you all as to what ideas you have. Okay. I agree completely. You ought to have one center. Chinese and went down 8th Street mm -hmm. and yep. publishing a good friend of mine. Yes. One thing I want to guard against though. Yes. I know why you make these comparisons. But they all are suffering. <coughs> you know, affairs are suffering. Pacific Island is suffering. So what we do after this is over with. Okay. In terms of the hearing. Okay. Make sure that I meet with the leadership of all those organizations. Okay. And all, we all support each other. Okay. It's going to be hard. But I want you all to work with me in calling out those council members who are ducking and dodging. Okay. Who talk one language and do another. Sorry. I'm tired of it. I see I, I've been here 30 years almost in this city on electoral politics. So I just, I'm just straight up. Okay. I think it's outrageous. I only have two people and two 
thousand dollars. That's and that's gonna change. I'm gonna push move on a lot more than that in this community. Because as I said earlier, the biblical analogy is that making brick without straws. We've been running around without straw a long time. Okay. And I understand fully now that I've been liberated, fully the despair and the need of the African community in DC, but also in Africa. Yes. The United States government has a watch view of Africa. The United States government gives more foreign aid to Israel than to all the African countries. That's outrageous. Even with Obama being president, that's happening. Just because we have a black president, we have a black mayor, a black council member, doesn't mean we, won't do, we don't have an obligation to look after our people. That's right. Simple as that. See, one thing about Marion Barry, I've learned over the years, I don't care what some people think about me. I care what the constituents think about me in terms of services. So, people can't intimidate me. Washington Post can't intimidate me. They try. I think they give up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Oh, I got one more. Thank you very much, Chairman Barry. The members of the Committee on Workforce and Community Affairs, I am also much to the watch who called President of, of the Nigerian Diaspora Organization in America's Washington, D.C. chapter. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my organization. The Nigerian Diaspora Organization is in, in the Americas 90A is a duly recognized umbrella organization for all Nigerians residing on the North and South American continents and the Caribbean. Established in 2000, 90A is a non profit organization headquartered in Washington, D.C. It draws resources from the synergy of all Nigerians living in the uh, Americas, 90A, Washington, D.C. chapter, the Baltimore chapter, and Inova All I, Region 2, area of the Nigerian Americas. Uh, since established in 2000 in Washington, Washington D.C., we have been involved in the district in many capacities. We have carried out uh, capacity building within the Afrocentric uh, communities, health fairs, and business meetings. Uh, we have partnered with educational uh, ed uh, ed institutions are currently partnering with some of them to find new ways of improving education in the district and in turn hoping to use this favorable out outcome and, uh, as a model in exporting the district and, and um, um, uh, uh, support of the mayor's uh, this export district, uh, export district to favorable uh, um, nations o uh, overseas. Um, we hope to achieve this through the sister city campaign, and with additional higher institutions learning to partner with UDC and uh, the CCDC to share educational research, retrain personnel, and also encourage international student programs from overseas. To all these, are, all these are geared to increasing revenue for the DC government. Um, let me, allow me to uh, mention a few of the events that we've done. The World Health Fair in 2009 in, the Washington, in Washington, D.C., Agricultural Forum, a support to the Nigerian Embassy and the CCA, which is Corporate, Corporate Council for Africa, April 2012. World Conference in August 2012, Infrastructural Forum, a support to the Nigerian Embassy and to the Corporate Council in Africa. Immigration Forum, February 2013, Health Fair and Symposium, which is upcoming on April 27, 2013, in partnership with the Afri Office of Africa. African Affairs. We also hope to do an educational summit in June 29th, 2013, Environmental Summit, uh, to be announced later, and uh, Business Investment Forum. Chairman Barry, as we know, um, the population of foreign-born immigrants in the D.C. has continued to increase, and as this, um, the population generally is increasing, most of these people are in, in the city, uh, most of them are depending on the uh, D.C. healthcare, um, health care, Healthcare uh, initiatives, and this weighs down on um, uh, the, the finances. Um, we intend to supplement the efforts of the district government through partnership with the OAA in creating more awareness to the community um, on recent health ch healthcare challenges, policies, and laws. Uh, we also intend to partner with the Office on African Affairs in their numerous campaigns on mental health, health, mental health, nutrition, overall wellness, eat right in this community, so as to. To help reduce mortality, dependence on the district health care coverage, and encourage overall increase in awareness and education on health care matters. Uh, we know that most of these populations are in the Ward 1, 5, um, 6, 7, and 8. And um, our, com our campaigns will be focused on these areas, and also we hope to partner with other groups to expand the campaigns to other wards over the extended time. Um, health care is a huge issue. And uh, we know that. Um, uh, most people, uh, the professional uh, great uh, in, uh, rising 
communities increase in the expenditure of uh, health care from the district rise, rise proportionally and even greater with the rising unaware populace. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, African diaspora in the district do not have, that do not have health care provided. This uh, um, are mostly those who are found in the uh, lower income area. And also, we also find out that uh, uh, with allowing the OIA grant authority, we could help eliminate the increasing rate of emergency room and hospital visits by partnering with the OIA and uh, to create a stand, uh, um, standard mo uh, surveillance mo monitoring system for HIV AIDS, adult health care, adult health and literacy, child health and literacy that provides origin beds and languages known, which are mostly vital information to provide outcomes and for data analysis, more proper data analysis. Um, our upcoming health fair on symposium on April 27th at the Nigerian Embassy in Washington is a place in partnership with the Mayor's Office on African Affairs to bring to district residents free medical screens, HIV screens, free mammogram scheduling and procedures, workshop on mental health, nutrition experts on Affordable Care Act. Um, our target is to continue to educate and create data awareness on diseases, processes, mutations, recent research, and know their bodily system campaign we are pushing to help reduce mortality rates and cost on health care. On immigration, um, we know that over between 2000 and 2009, there has been an increase in 97 percent um, African immigrants to the United States as a whole. And this uh, mostly within the country, the Anglophone countries of Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Liberia, Cameroon, Syria alone, which together accounted for 46 percent. Um, amongst this, unauthorized uh, immigrants in the U.S., uh, African, black African uh, immigrants share somewhat lower than 21 uh, percent. Can you round down for a minute? To yes, one minute. Okay. A few minutes over. But I like what you're saying, just wrap it up. Wrap up, okay. Okay, we, we also did a work conference, and we, and it, and that we intended, we brought in businessmen from Africa, Europe, and the United States, and this should receive more ways of expanding commerce, trade, and technology. We also encouraging black African, uh, African businessmen to come in and invest heavily in the district. Um, I want to end this uh, by saying this, please. Uh, the resources could be channeled in the following, uh, the following. Support research targeted at this, communities on health, on health, culture, languages, and human development. Supporting trade, bilateral agreements, and com committing to sister city agreements, and increasing funding to the OAA so as to partner with local groups like us in creating ways of increasing revenue to the district go government through grants. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. I'm, I'm looking forward to answering any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Let me ask you uh, what is happening in the African business community? Those Africans who are born in Africa, and even African Americans. What structure and organization that work to promote the uh, growth and development of African-owned businesses? What is happening? I didn't, I didn't what, is happening what is happening to promote African-owned businesses in the District of Columbia? Is there a vehicle that's an advocate uh, for these businesses? Is yes. We're well, using, well, using, um using forums we're using health fairs where uh, we're hoping that um, if the OA gets the grants and authority we can also use them to create more awareness. What's happening is that most of the businesses in the African community uh, are not harnessing all the um, available resources out there that will help them uh, grow as businesses. In Here's the problem. Most of the African owned businesses that I know about they done it on their own. They just struggle through it, find the capital and go for I want to do more than that. I want to figure out how we use money to help the development of these businesses. How we give technical assistance to these businesses. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So, uh, all right. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I want to take a break for a minute. About 10 minutes.
give give her <laughs> like to reconvene the meeting and we have uh, two witnesses. Pantera Carroll and Dr. Mina Damacy. All right, I'll start then. Um, greetings, uh, Chairman Barry. Thank you for your time and consideration. My name is Dr. Menon Demise. I stand before you as a resident of D.C. in Ward 4, who is proud to be part of a racially and ethnically diverse city that serves as our nation's capital. Uh, I also want to reiterate and speak to the urgency of ensuring that the budget address the growing needs and concerns of the African immigrant population that makes up close to 17% of the district's entire immigrant population, which, by the way, is the highest proportion of African-born residents of any major city in the U.S. It is probably old news by now since we're on panel four, uh, you know, that the Office of African Affairs does not have grant-making authority um, and receives a surprisingly low budget compared to the Latino and Asian offices, but for me this news is never old. Still, the Office of A on African Affairs is doing wonderful work in service of Africans in D.C., and I would like to see this office get more support in order to better serve the many residents, businesses, organizations who uh, otherwise tend to stay invisible and isolated from the civic process. As a senior policy analyst for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, I work to advance the global mission of the black agenda for African Americans here in D.C. and across the United States. You may have heard that the Congressional Black Caucus recently created an immigration task force to speak to the needs of immigrants of African descent in particular. As a city with the highest population of Ethiopians in the United States, as well as Nigerians, Ghanaians, Liberians, Sudanese, Eritreans, it is important that the city also do its part at a local level to ensure the well-being of a substantial segment of its population that has greatly advanced the economic growth in the private and public sector. The D.C. City Council should take advantage of working in partnership with national organizations like the CBCF and think tanks like us that are ready to serve the needs of black minority communities and coalition build with Africans, Latinos, Asians, and the broader immigrant community. In light of immigration reform and the pressing needs African immigrants are facing in the district, such as a lack of information for goods and services, gentrification, disproportional rates of health conditions compounded by issues of cultural differences and linguistic barriers, it is vital that the Office of African Affairs be financially equipped to successfully do its job. Again, I want to reiterate the importance of coalition building and collaborating with organizations like the CBCF to advance the agenda of both African Americans and Africans. And that would be a step in the right direction. And we are here and we are ready to work with you. Yesterday I had um, the opportunity to ask Mayor Gray about how the budget addresses the needs of African immigrants and he shared his support for immigration reform and advancing opportunity. For over 10 years I have served as the National Youth Coordinator for the Society of Ethiopians established in the Diaspora, a nonprofit based here in D.C. since 1993 that encourages community service, civic engagement, and academic excellence in order to help Ethiopian Americans become productive citizens of society. SEED and many other African community organizations in the district work diligently and often with shoestring or non-existent budgets to support new African immigrants as they overcome unimaginable challenges building a life in an entire entirely new and foreign place. These organizations have unique linguistic and cultural competence that enables them to provide an indispensable safety net to families who call D.C. their home. 
These organizations are critical allies and a resource to D.C. government agencies who work to ensure a decent quality life for all residents and are critical to the development and sustainability of a thriving African community in D.C. and I ask that you invest in them. I would like to see that the fiscal 14 budget, our collective moral document, better reflect the investment and commitment that I know you have uh, expressed and we support and thank you for that, uh, Chairman Barry, um, for cultivating and enhancing the many diverse immigrant communities that make the District of Columbia a truly productive and vibrant home for us all. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Missy. Are you uh, Ethiopian? Yes, sir. Born in Cleveland, Ohio. But, but child of, of Ethiopian parents, That's yes. That's great. That's wonderful. And you've been to Ethiopia, I'm sure. I have. I've been at it several times. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Mm -hmm. I've been at it several times. Been a good time, been a not so good time. Mm -hmm. I was there when the Civil War was going on. Uh, I, I didn't stay long. Because they don't know me from Hattie Towns Cat, so I didn't want to be uh, involved with that. I really appreciate your, your testimony. Let me just say this, Mayor Gray is a good person, good mayor. But he has not put his money where his mouth is. When you said he shared, he shared with me. I know better. Where I gauge what you really stand for, where you put your money. And this committee is going to put money that can help this community. Outside the fact I'm African American, uh, with groups in Africa, uh, as a human being, I'm going to do that. So rest assured, you're going to see something happen. Thank you. Who's getting the foundation now? We've transitioned to a new president, Chinese Washington. I'll do that. I'll just keep that about it. <laughs> One thing I find about me, I know a lot of the answers before I ask them, but I, because we on, we'll, we'll be on television, I want you to tell the public that. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilman Barry. <coughs> My name is Fonsa Tarawule, and I am a DC resident and a sophomore political science major at Howard University. I am a first generation African with parents from Mali. From this past academic year, 2012 to 2014, I will be serving as the vice president for the Howard University African Students Association. Since Mabosala Asham Paola, the current president of the organization, and I have had the opportunity to serve the African student population at Howard University. We saw it vital to reach out to the surrounding DC communities. One of the organizations we reached out to is the Office of African Affairs, a partnership that we are incredibly grateful for and has expanded our organization's network. The beautiful thing about any organization with people who are passionate about serving others is that with or without adequate resources, they will make sure people are reached and they will go above and beyond the call of duty to do so. This is evident in organizations we have partnered with, such as the Office of African Affairs and the African Immigrant Refugee Foundation. All people we have come in contact with in these organizations have a clear and distinct passion for extending services to the African population. Through our partnership with the Office of African Affairs, we have had the opportunity to witness and be a part of the We Count initiative, which focused on gathering information about surrounding African-owned businesses in D.C. We were able to hold workshops at our school regarding mental health and stigma surrounding this topic in the African community. We have been able to hold an interactive and successful panel discussion about the idea of what does it mean to be African, which addresses the question of identity. With the OAA support, we were able to have women represented on this panel discussion. We have also seen the OAA testify in support of the DREAM Act, showing how the OAA is the voice for peoples who often go unheard. The Office of African Affairs serves as the link between all African organizations in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, and it also serves as a voice for people who are most often neglected, which includes our African youth population. African youth and the children of immigrants in general are some of the hardest working individuals in this country, especially when it comes to our education. We are often charged with the positive burden to do well in school, so we may 
use the educational opportunities we have to help our families, whether they are stationed here in America or back home in the motherland. Some concerns that African youth have, especially at the university level, and those who are interested in attending the university, include lack of access to scholarships. Imagine being first in your class since the age of 10 when your family came here, but still unable to go to any prestigious university you get into because of your status here in America as an immigrant. Many African youth who are not citizens work very hard in school but are not offered opportunities like tuition scholarships or even eligible for book vouchers. These opportunities make it easier to go day by day as a student and truly have time to indulge in the college experience that everyone should be able to cherish. While the African Immigrant Refugee Foundation may not be able to fund scholarships at this time, it provides a space which allows African youth to, to grow and feel comfortable in their own skin and be prideful of where they come from. AirFound is an organization that thrives off of passionate volunteers who remind African youth that they are valuable in our society and do not want to see youth fall into the cracks here in America. We noticed this year that AirFound does not receive a lot of funding and they are struggling financially. This year we put on a fashion show and put proceeds towards the organization. We also started an AirFound shadowing, shadowing program which allows AirFound participants to shadow African college students here on Howard University's campus. These are some of the initiatives that volunteers put on to ensure that AirFound is successful. The Howard University African Student Association would like to see more financial backing for organizations like the OAA, AirFound, and for African youth. It is in these networks where investment lies in the DC African community and it will allow the DC African community to continue to grow. And this community is already expanding, so it would be necessary to have some kind of support for it. Thank you very much, Ms. Fenton. How do you pronounce your last name? Tarawale. Tarawale. <laughs> How about that, huh? <laughs> I know it's French based because Mali is a, is a fr former French colony. And I have been to Mali. <laughs> that I will tell you a, a story. I was coming from, I think, Cameroon or no, Kudu, I think. And I had some French based money. I can't think of the name of the money. And I got to the airport in Mali. I, I landed in Mali. I spent a couple of days there and then go on. As it turned out, the value of the money I had was not the same value of the money that you had. And so I lost a little money in that process. <laughs> but it's all right. <laughs> you know, the uh, colonial powers are trying to divide us, and so I understand that. And you give me some ideas. I intend to not only give the office grant making authority, but to put a significant money in there so that uh, they can have a Beautiful decision to make about organizations. Tell the Association of African Students at Howard. What 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 uh, what membership do you have? What size? Well, in total, on Howard University's campus, including our dental and medical and law school, we have about 1,000 students who are international and from the continent. That's great. And as far as membership. We've been able to reach up to 400 people, but paid membership is about 100. Well, get on that case. You ought to be paying dues. <laughs> and I'm going to get on case, too. And when I come down and meet with you, I'll see you all. You know, what happens to some people? They have what I call deep pockets and short arms, <laughs> which means they don't go in and get something out of it. The other thing, the other problem we have, not only just with Africans, African Americans, is that some people forget from which they came. They seem to forget that. But we're going to keep reminding people of African descent and African Americans that this is an important venture for us. It's just because we've got a black president doesn't mean that we've solved all these problems. And I'm 
I've gotten some ideas about uh, the authors who tell you African owned businesses. I'm going to probably look at putting a staff there that only deals with most of these African owned businesses where you get capital from, what the government is doing and not doing. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call uh, the director of the office, Ngazi Namizi. Welcome. Fellow Nigerian. <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I'm an honorary chief. You, know. you ready? Ready. Do you swear on the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give to this community, committee, is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Chief uh, Chairman Mary members of the Colonial Workforce and Community Affairs, and the members of the public. My name is Ngozi Mezi. I am the Executive Director of the D.C. Mayor's Office on African Affairs. I am pleased to testify before you today on Mayor Vincent C. Gray's fiscal year 2014 budget and confidently share that OAA's FY 2014 proposed budget fully and wholly addresses the agency's funding needs. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, Mayor Vincent C. Gray's FY 2014 budget submission focuses on three priorities. Number one, growing and diversifying the economy. Wait, do you have a written statement that we can get? I do have a written statement. Can we have it, please? Sure. Now, I expect these department heads, office heads, have a written statement. The public, I can understand, and may I have the facilities to do it. Proceed. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, Mary Gray's FY 2014 budget submission focuses on three priorities. Number one, growing and diversifying the economy. Number two, educating our children and preparing our workforce for a new economy. And three, improving the quality of life of all district residents. The mission of the D.C. Mayor's Office on African Affairs is to ensure access and connectedness of district government services, information, and resources to the district's African community. Additionally, OAA increases district government understanding of the African community's complexities and needs by educating district government and other and agencies within district government on the needs and trends in the African community. This understanding in turn helps shape the district's overall programming in general and OAA's programmatic strategic objectives and activities in particular. The mayor's proposed budget provides the resources that OAA needs to fully and wholly um, address our 2014 mandates and strategic goals. In FY 2014, um, OIL will continue to utilize fiscally responsible strategies to reach out to our most disconnected residents by engaging organized hubs in the African immigrant community to extend our reach into diverse ethnic and faith-based association groups, particularly in the Muslim and Francophone communities. Work collaboratively with DC government agencies 
the Commission on African Affairs, federal government agencies, nonprofits, the private sector, community-based and faith-based organizations to host educational workshops, seminars, and information sessions on our administration's targeted priorities. We'll continue to increase multicultural understanding, awareness, and collaboration amongst all communities in the District of Columbia, particularly those communities of African descent, via organized discussions, commemoration events, and cultural events. We'll continue to motivate positive health behavior changes while promoting health and wellness in the district's African community by connecting community members to screenings and testings and vital health services. This is actually currently being done um, through ERA's Team Africa, which stands for Think, Eat, Act, Move Health Education and Outreach Campaign, which was initiated in partnership with the 13-member Team Africa Coordinating Committee of DC government representatives, health professionals, community-based organizations, and health advocates. We will continue to enhance the capacity of community-based organizations and faith-based organizations that serve our city's most vulnerable African immigrants, and to ensure that they continue to remain strong pillars of support and development in the African community. We'll continue strengthening the district's African business community by connecting businesses to resources that they need to grow and thrive here in the District of Columbia. Lastly, OIL will continue to build its internal capacity by increasing our volunteer and intern recruitment to show up critical agency functions. I want to emphasize my absolute conf confidence in um, establishing or, or accomplishing OIL's key objectives that we have established for f 14 with the mayor's proposed budget. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rosie. Ms. Lodi, um, well, I'll ask this way. In light of what you have heard today from this table, how can you then say that the mayor's proposed budget provides some resources that OA needs to fill out fill our protein lending. How can you say that? I think the mayor's budget absolutely provides the resources. It gives room for um, just creative and creative, creative and strategies. Okay, let's stop this. I'm not going that way. Okay. You know, I, I can't sit here and listen to the hue and the cry of people about the inadequacy of this budget. Let you come here. Saying it's enough. So I think you just ought to stop that, Mr. Kilday. Now I don't want anybody coming to this committee without acknowledging maybe the mayor's doing this, doing this. But don't ever tell me that this budget fulfills the mandate of the African community. Okay, Mr. Chairman, if I could no, just no, interject. No, 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 stop it. Stop it. Please. I know you're going to point to the other mayor. You to represent the mayor's point of view. Mr. Bade knows that. He also knows that I'm not going to sit here and listen to all the testimony about things that need to be done. You come in here and just say, it's all we need. I don't, I mean, I understand you work for the mayor, but the mayor doesn't believe that either. The mayor allows his department heads to express themselves. Ms. Bade, why don't you sit over there for a minute? Sorry. I mean, I'm totally outrageous. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you know what it's like to be an appointee uh, of an administration. And it, there's probably no agency or office within the District of Columbia government that probably doesn't merit uh, more resources. But we also understand <laughs> the economic realities of the, of the district um, and the mandates that we have from our, our leaders, uh, our, our bosses. It is not our role. Uh, as appointees of the Gray administration ever to dispute the mayor's proposal submissions. That's not what I'm getting at. What you just said is an adequate statement for any and all committees that you have to follow the mayor's mandate. I understand that. I was mayor for 16 years. I don't want like, I don't want to suppose anybody else cover here and in light of that testimony and saying, well, I understand that. So emphatic that with two FTEs and a two hundred thousand dollar budget, you can meet the needs of this community. And so I'm going to just dismiss it. I'm not going to carry on with that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You want to understand what's happening here? You know, I, I expect the department is to echo the mayor's philosophy. 
etc. But I don't, I don't believe that we can sit here and hear all that testimony about the great need, undisputed, and say that two FTEs and $200,000 is enough to meet these needs. All right? And so I'm going to talk to the mayor about this. I don't like this. You know, the idea is to give the public confidence in what we're trying to get done. And when you sit here and say something different about that, uh, I, I've had department heads who come before that didn't like necessarily what was going on, but they expressed it a lot differently. The Office of Asian, for instance, Mr. Thompson, that an outstanding job. He needs a lot, a lot, a lot more money, and he lets the advocates talk about that money. We have to sit here in front of this committee and agree that two FTEs and $12,000 it's enough to meet the needs. And such my intelligence. And such the intelligence of this community. And I'm getting outraged, you know. I mean, it, 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 I can't take it anymore. I'm going to talk with the mayor about this person, Steve, because I don't like this kind of testimony. Where it's like telling me it's raining outside and go get my umbrella. Now go out there and no rain is out there. That's <laughs> craziness. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move rapidly. I took a break about 1.15 to go to another hearing, but I'll be back. Uh, the office of uh, GLBT, Stuart in Washington. Director of the office, Stuart, welcome. Yes. Again, you're relatively new to me, but uh, you're not new to the cause. So, welcome. you're about to give to this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon. Well, nice day. All right. Everybody help us on the way. All right. It's coming. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, Chairman Barry and staff. I am Sterling Washington, the director of the Mayor's Office of Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Affairs. Uh, before I proceed, I'd like to thank you publicly for creating the Mayor's Office of GLBT Affairs and your support of the district's LGBT community for over 30 years. As you know, the mission of the Mayor's Office of GLBT Affairs is to provide constituent services and information to the GLBT community through community outreach and public education activities. Moreover, the office advises the Mayor and the D.C. government on the needs of LGBT <coughs> residents of the District of Columbia. I am pleased to testify before you today on Mayor Gray's fiscal year 2014 budget and I'm happy to share the mayor's uh, priorities for FY 2014. Uh, those priorities are growing, diversifying the economy, educating our children, and preparing our workforce for a new economy, and improving the quality of life for all residents. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to testify, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. What are some of the challenges facing this office? Is it automatically up? Budgetary. Now, I don't expect you to go for the mayor's budget because I understand how that works. Mm -hmm. But I think you can put it in the context of what you hear out in the community. Yes. Um, so some of the, the challenges that we have, some of the priorities that we have that uh, are very important this year are uh, creating a, an LGBT health survey for the District of Columbia and um, surveying at least 750 of the LGBT residents here in the district uh, to get an assessment of what the health needs are. Um, How much do you think it would cost? 
Got an idea? Uh, total, I, I do not know. We're, work, we're doing it all in-house with in concert with the Department of Health. Well, we're working on that. Uh, in, my, in my philosophy, is very simple. These offices have great difficulty anyway mm -hmm. in terms of reaching the population that we need. And with a $6 billion budget, we ought to be able to do better than that. So I, I do. Because mm -hmm. on that ground, I want you to get in difficulty with the layout kind of thing. Uh, what are the other challenges you have? Well, and, and I would just add that in that, that example I used, the uh, Dr. Uh, Saul Levin of the Department of Health is working closely with us to uh, reach those needs. Um, some of the other challenges um, and, and challenges that we're facing are really yeah, let, me that, let me just say that this city has been in the forefront of the HIV AIDS crisis. Absolutely. We dispelled a lot of myths that this was a predominantly white male problem uh, that the, the fastest growing population in D.C. of women between the age niggas. 18 and 25, we've had very good success in reaching out on a very difficult subject and identifying those who do or don't, uh, do or don't uh, have this terrible situation going on. And so I think the public ought to know that we've done that. And thank you for your, your uh, statements about my 30 years of strong support. You're welcome. Thank you. Community. Uh, I was in this when it wasn't popular. Mm -hmm. I recall when I was on the school board, president of the school board. And the school system wanted to fire a white male teacher at McKinley Town. I stepped in and said, no way, you're not doing it. And we changed the whole policy of the school system about that. There have been a lot of debates about domestic violence, about uh, domestic partnerships, about all these kind of things. And this city has stood strong. The mayor has stood strong. The majority of the council members have stood strong about this. So I think it's primary for the public may be watching as to what this city has done. Uh, we had a, a survey in, in prison. And voluntarily, I think about 90% of the people they are voluntarily. Now they got challenged now with these new cocktails, etc., to make sure that people are compliant before it's too late. That PCS count don't run out to a point where it becomes AIDS. And so I want to thank you for your leadership. You should be in that area where I want the public to know that this city is committed all the way to all we can in terms of. Uh, Identifying and, and, and the HIV AIDS crisis, not the only crisis we have here, we have other health crises where people just refuse to find out their status. I was talking to a lady about two or three weeks ago. I said, Mr. Barry, uh, what I don't know won't hurt me after you alive, it will hurt you. It may kill you. That's kind of attitude we don't want to take. That your health. It's the most important part of your life, but I'm concerned. Now, I've not always seen it that way. I've been like everybody else. It's all right. You know, I had prostate cancer 18 years ago. And I, I was about as compliant before then as, as I am now. I had a kidney transplant. And renal failure is the third leading cause of death among black people. Mm -hmm. Third. And so uh, I'm glad that with this city is in the forefront of this. I'm very honored that the city named uh, a program after my wife, Ethel Barry. Yes. It's a good project. She's going to heaven now, but we know what she did while she was here. And her commitment to this situation. And so continue, I'm sorry, I just had to, had to put it out there. Oh, no, no, that's, that's fine. Um, and I, I knew your uh, late wife. Actually, she went to school with my mother, so. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Oh, how about that? Huh? 
Um, so um, getting back to your question, so some of the other challenges um, that we're facing, I've, I've met uh, with the directors of the Office of uh, African Affairs, uh, director of the Office of Asian Affairs and Latino Affairs, um, each in an effort to reach out to those uh, communities. That's uh, something we have developed plans for, for reaching out to the LGBT African uh, community, Latino and um, Asian American uh, community, uh, which are often neglected. If folks are not out and open, it, it can be a challenge to reach them. So I've worked with each of those directors to circulate uh, information about the office on their listservs so that we can reach those populations and begin to address those needs. Um, in that regard, you know, different societies have different approaches yes. to the situation. Uh, in some society, the religious part of it is more dominant than anything else about what God intended. Mm -hmm. And might they know what God intended, so we at the same time, and God did this. And, uh, and we just have to keep working on ways of reaching uh, different populations who may have different philosophies. Take, for instance, the HIV AIDS virus. <coughs> Africa has been ravaged by this. Yes. Ravaged by this. We have thousands of young people who have been abandoned, who have this virus, and who die over time. So that's another aspect of, I think, your, your, yes. uh, your office. I just thought about sitting here. It's how we can be of help to the African community, the Latino community. And I, I, I'm going to probably talk to you about this, talk to me about this. How do we establish the resources in your office that can assist these others? Or how we can get the health department to go beyond what they're doing now in regard? Yeah, the other problem we have um, in the immigrant community, the same as we have here, is drug abuse. And that's the problem we've got to get on top of. Have I'm on sorry, I missed that. That's the problem we have to get on top of oh. in terms of the... Uh, Second abuse situation. Mm -hmm. And so uh growing with challenges. Yes. What is she you have other other challenges? Oh, um well, one of the, the big challenges that, that we have this year is we are continuing the rollout of the uh, LGBT cultural competency training of district employees that uh, the mayor began last year for um, the managerial, the MSS employees, we are beginning to roll out to the other employees this year with the goal of uh, training 20% of them. Uh, yesterday I was, uh, I did a training of trainers session so that we, we being my deputy director and I have some assistance in uh, rolling out this training to the district government employees. A, a lot of people don't realize but the District of Columbia has the highest percentage of LGBT people in the country. Um, not in sheer numbers, but percentage-wise at 10%. And uh, actually that number is probably a little bit higher than 10%, uh, given that people who responded to the survey had to be out to an extent in order to uh, identify themselves as LGBT. So that's, that's one of the challenges. We're getting a lot of assistance from uh, the District Department of Human Resources and uh, what we're calling uh, champions of change within the various agencies who will encourage their co-workers to attend the training um, and will do some of the training themselves. There is also the ability for employees to take the training online. Um, and this is our effort to equip, equip the uh, 30,000 plus district employees with uh, best practices for interacting with LGBT residents. Thank you very much. We still have a lot of distance to go. Yes, we do. In terms of educating this community and other communities, uh, there's still a lot of phobias around here. Yeah. There are a lot of people. Absolutely. Uh, and we have to continue. The good news, I, I think we're making some progress in the black religious community. Yes. Uh, as you know, my position on that. But I've, I've gotten to the point where they, they now say, the law is the law. Mm -hmm. And they still have the individual biases against them. 
Yes. And so we're going to continue to work with Reverend Nutt all and others and, and try to spread the word. Because <laughs> see, one thing about me, people know that I'm serious and sincere. I sometimes take political positions, sometimes I take personal positions. That's all part of being elected official. But I'm committed to do all I can to get the community educated to this situation. It is not just your problem or my problem. It's all of our challenges as we go forward. Uh, I intend to talk with you further about, uh, and, well, I'll talk with the mayor first about this, the kind of resources I'm going to propose. But I, but I, I want to say to the mayor, allow your department heads to at least discuss whether what I'm making sense, not about policy, but about just putting money in various places. In terms of the uh, GLBT community, what have we done as a government to assist this community? I'm sorry, I missed I'm the guy as a government to assist the GLBT community in terms of businesses. What are we doing? Oh, uh, well, interestingly, um, I will be attending the uh, Capital Area Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce dinner tonight. Uh, we will be working. Um, this year in doing some uh, workshops on how to start your own business and we'll be working in concert with some of the community organizations to promote that and get assistance from those those organizations I will also be uh, working on uh, helping the small businesses in the area reach out to uh, prospective employees uh, our web website is being redone and part of what is being added to it uh, will be employment resources because one of the issues we found is that if people can't pay their rent or uh, are in fear of being kicked out of their homes, they're less likely to, for instance, adhere to a medication regimen if they have HIV or diabetes. It's just not something that is at the top of their radar if they're worried about employment. Uh, so we'll be using the website as a means to inform people about the district's one hire, um, uh, one city, one hire program, as well as give an opportunity for some of the, the local businesses to uh, promote vacancy announcements that they may have through our website. I think that we probably need more counseling among this community too. Even though people come out of the closet and they, and they have not yet come out on their virus situation. It's, it's a tough road. And yes. I know some friends of mine who have died from this virus. Mm -hmm. I know some friends of mine who were in denial the day they died. And uh, we've got to do a lot more work. How do you get people to? But you're right. I don't worry about where I'm going to get the next meal mm -hmm. or where I'm going to sleep tonight. I may want to be concerned about that. But that just doesn't become a priority. I have to disagree with that. I have to disagree with that. I think your health is the most important part of your life. Yes. And your spiritual life is the most important part of your life. And your physical life is the most important health. Because if, if you're ill, potentially ill, you can't plan. You can't work. You can't do anything. And we have substance abuse that got to be better. On, focus on that in this community. Absolutely. For other communities. And Apple is, is, is not productive at all. So I tell you that. We're going to make it productive. Yes. Because there are too many people who need this kind of help. Absolutely. Brenda Donald, CSFA. Yes. And she sent 58 young people over to Apple. And only five showed up. I could predict it then. Most of these young people are in denial anyway about whether or not they need any help. Uh -huh. And yet, so we've got to figure out various ways to get them this help, how to get people compliant uh, who are in denial. Not just with that, people are in denial about depression, they're in denial about all these kind of things. Yes. And, and There's a great stigma associated with being in foster care still, and I think yeah, that's no a part of it. Yeah. The, the, in terms of depression. That affects millions of Americans and thousands of DC citizens. But it's a hard job to get people to understand that there is some help and some hope. That the 
emotion is a matter of chemical things in your body, in your head. Now it's all just about all the problems you may have. Mm -hmm. So we got a big world to hold. Where you, where'd you grow up? I actually grew up here in the district uh, in Shepherd Park. Oh, that's great. Which goes to? Uh, Shepherd Elementary School, then to Alice Dill Junior High School, and then to Wilson. How about that? And my son, uh, who's now 32, uh, went to private school and did a third grade at Dodge. He was in four. He was in four. And then he went to St. Albans in the fourth grade. I was opposed to that, but my wife said, well, let's, let's do it. And so we divided up the tuition. I said, I pay half and you pay half. So he went there. And in the fifth grade, it was an awful experience. We had an opportunity to figure out what to do. And we sent him to Merch Elementary, out of boundaries. Mm -hmm. They went to Jefferson, the sixth grade, out of boundary. Mm -hmm. My younger brother went to Jefferson. He did. <laughs> He might have gone there with Chris, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> he went to Wilson, mm -hmm. not about. Well, in 1998, Wilson High School. Well, what about those parents that don't have those connections to get that done? Don't have the transportation to get that done? Don't have the move at all to maneuver this terrible school system? So we're fighting the fight. Yes. It's every parent and every student have a quality seat in the neighborhood. Yes. That. So uh, I'm delighted that you were head of that office. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Thank uh, you. No offense to anybody else, but uh, we have fresh ideas, fresh blood, fresh direction. So uh, I'm going to be working even closer with you. Thank you. Yeah, working closer with you. And I'm going to add some money. Which is a matter of work. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lewis. And thank you for your commitment. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your support. Thank you. You, uh, the advisory council, Cedric Jennings, welcome. A Ward 8 resident and a committed person to head this organization. You have a written statement? Yes, sir. That's where you're in. Ready? Yes, sir. It is fair under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give to this committee is the truth, the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Our firm. Uh, our firm. Thank you. Got a written statement? Yes, sir. We we'll submit it. Good afternoon, Chairman Barry and staff, as well as the committee on the work on workforce and community affairs. My name is Cedric Jennings, Director of the D.C. Youth Advisory Council, and I'm pleased to testify before you today in support of Mayor Gray's fiscal 2014 budget. As we move forward into fiscal year 2014, we look forward, the Youth Advisory Council, that is, to continue implementation of quality programming for D.C. youth that promotes civic engagement, life skills, and community service. As a director of the D.C. Youth Advisory Council, I remain committed to working with the youth of the District of Columbia to build a Youth Advisory Council that will be esteemed as a model and a success for the District of Columbia. Thank you, Chairman Barry and committee members for the opportunity to share testimony. And I welcome any questions. Thank you for your leadership in this area. A couple of things. One, I intend to propose an expanded structure. I'd like to get your input on that more young people to be involved and to commend you for what you've done with the situation. Thank 
I intend to be looking at ways of adding money to the budget as best as I can. So, uh, what, are, what are some of the challenges facing your office? Well, I think one of our major challenges as it relates to the youth is that you live, we, the youth live in a society today where they, they want to, they, they want more material things and it's really difficult sometimes to challenge their mindset as it relates to community service. And so we work very diligently to create opportunities for them where they can see um, uh, their growth potential and how um, community involvement can benefit them as they prepare for college and the future. So that's one of our biggest challenges that we work so diligently to uh, address. What about the drop dropout rate in the District of Columbia? <laughs> well, it has in the nation. Well, one of the things we have to recognize is that it doesn't all fall on one person, but it takes it takes all of us to lock arms and really to work well, with. How do you get all of us locking arms? How do you do that? <laughs> well, you need to um, we need to communicate first of all. We need to come together regularly. <laughs> Um, and we need to have our youth involved in that discussion um, so that their needs are, we're showing that their needs are being met and that we can see their perspective as we make decisions about what to do about the dropout rate. Uh, let me share with you uh, something that I know from being on the education committee. Mm -hmm. And that is with these application schools, so we've got Walls, Benefit, mm -hmm. and Bethelton. Mm -hmm. 99% of the people who apply want to be there. They want to be there. They wouldn't apply if they didn't want to be there. They're paying for them there. Whereas the traditional public schools, you have to be there because you're in that boundary. Whether you like it or not. We have a significant number of young people who don't want to be in school. They don't see any benefits. Mm -hmm. I think it's wrong. I've talked to my son about that recently. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we need to brainstorm on that. Mm -hmm. so what we can, what can we do to create more interest in our public schools? I talked to the chancellor about that. Mm -hmm. You know, but in my ward has its Anacostia. Mm -hmm. Anacostia has a 13 percent reading and math rate that's going to go. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tolerate that kind of thing happening to us. On the other hand, these schools have had resources particularly to meet the needs of special needs, children, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been on the, on the Chancellor's case and will be on it about development of full-fledged uh, 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 athletic program. See, I think we ought to be athletically excellent and academically excellent. Mm -hmm. As you very well know, there's a lot of scholarships yes. out here in the sports area. A person teaches such teamwork that you have to have. Mm -hmm. You have a person from coming to Terry's family, the same team from, from Barry Farms. You can't afford to fight because the team will suffer from that. So I'm going to be asking you help young people to help push this athletic excellent situation. Well, probably uh, this man a plan. We may have submitted a plan uh, in three to six months. So uh, I want to get ready for the next budget year. We want to put $4 million in the budget. Out of this, $700 million in schools. So uh, it's helping that. The, the other thing we have to do, and you know this too, uh, we, we have to make education relevant to our young people. So we have a time in the black community where we poor or not, education is the top of our agenda. When I was growing up, education, my mother went to the third grade, father to the fifth grade. They all say to me, I don't care what you do, you get yourself from education. It's not even thought of talking about it. But it was serious. We were lost at the young man's zest for education. So we've got to figure out how we regain it. Now, what has happened, poverty has become the major thing. Two thirds of our public school students are below the poverty line. 32,000 out of 47,000. And so we all get to pull together around all these situations. Mm -hmm. Not your job alone, not mine alone, not anybody's job alone. Right. It's collectively. What bothers me is people say, well, it takes a village to raise a child. People don't even think about doing that. They, this is mouth it. It's a nice rhetoric, nice sounding thing. Right. 
What are you doing on a daily basis? Right. How do you get these parents to be more responsible for their children? How do you get these students more responsible for themselves? Mm -hmm. And part of it is the natural government, particularly with welfare, has made people dependent. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to see a lot from us. Anything you want to add before you go? I just, I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve um, the youth of the District of Columbia. I'm a, uh, I was born and raised in the District of Columbia, and um, where did you go to school? I um, graduated from Ketchum Elementary School. Uh, I attended Jefferson, it was junior high school then with Vera White, Ms. Vera White. And then I graduated. Vera White was uh, very young when Anthony and I decided to send uh, her to Jefferson. Mm -hmm. She was a no nonsense, humane kind of person. In fact, I used to kid her. She she'd be working till nine, ten o'clock at night. Yes. And I said, Vera, do you have a husband? Good <laughs> job is my husband. <laughs> and she said, I hope you tell you tell my my husband that it's all right, you know. <laughs> but and I ultimately graduated from Baloo High School. Oh, you so um, you know, I just I feel fortunate to have come through the D C public school system that was stellar, um, when I attended. Um I mean, it had its issues at that time, but for the most part, I can say that I got quality education um, that served me well as I endeavored into collegiate. Um, what college? I attended Brown University for undergraduate studies. Oh, my God. Yeah. What, what did you major? I majored in education with a, a minor in applied mathematics. Uh, that's, that's very good. Mm -hmm. I guess you know, I know you know, we have a brand new balloon coming. Yeah. Over $120 million mm -hmm. at the city. Is going to spend uh, my great support, my pushing hard. Mm -hmm. We will open in August of 2014. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the design? Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put the design up so everybody can see that great design mm -hmm. of blue. And my attitude about education is that the structure is only part of the situation. What do you do inside that structure? Absolutely. What kind of attitude do you create among our students? Mr. Jackson at Dunbar is an example of how you turn that school around. Just with attitude. He's made everybody there responsible for the welfare of these students. Everybody. Solomon himself. He stands outside the door every morning reading students by name, making them feel that they are welcome in this situation. That's not true in a lot of our schools. Mm -hmm. People feel hostile about it. They don't want to go up there. And so uh, I'm going to uh, get that to put it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Engagement. Fimmers, Directed Office. Good afternoon, sir. Get sworn in quickly. Ray? Yes, sir. <coughs> Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give to this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I affirm, sir. Thank you. Thank you. That's blue. That is the new blue. Isn't that fantastic? Wow. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. In Southeast Washington, the poorest ward in the city, able to bring that new blue. Not only what's happening on the outside, what's happening in the inside. Uh, we have a whole new direction. Uh, at at Blue, uh, the 1,500 students capacity, the 800 students have to find some other programming to also go in there. But you know, there's a strange thing. We talk about Blue, and people say, Why are you doing that money? Why are you doing all that? And you ask, I remind them, we spent over $120 million for Muslims.
Everybody see that? Yes, sir. You see? All right. Yes, sir. We're going to have a new balloon. I mean, look at this. How many of you all have seen the old balloon? The majority of you have not seen it. I would suggest to the mayor that he organize among all these department heads and the commissions an afternoon of the old balloon. You can see what the new balloon looks like. It's probably going to be the captain lead agency in terms of the environment. All right, prepare to listen to the mayor. Okay. Proceed, Mrs. Emmers. Then rest. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mayor Barry. Good afternoon, Mr. Ward. Miss Ward, I'm sorry. Mr. King and Ms. Reyes. Uh, our office wants to thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for your support. Uh, on a personal note, as a Latino, uh, I am very proud of the work you've done historically on behalf of the Latino community. It is a testament of why I am here sitting here before you today, to give, the, uh, give us access and a seat at the table, also for Ms. Reyes and for Ms. Uh, Roxana Olivas, who is the Director of Latino Affairs. Your work on behalf of this community is, is, is inspiring, and this is why we're here in many ways. Um, I'm here to support, of course, Mayor Vincent C. Gray's budget. We want to continue growing and diversifying our economy, educating our children, and preparing our workforce for the new economy, improving the quality of life for all residents. Those are the three priorities. There's a lot of challenges, and um, we are more than honored to have the responsibility to tackle those challenges. And uh, you and your team have been a great example I have a great leader in Mayor Gray and Mr. Glade, and a great team of world liaisons that we work with. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, Mr. Mayor, at this time. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Mayor, I know about the budget, but can you describe what your office does? Yes, sir. And how it works? Essentially, we respond to complaints, concerns, um, things that are preoccupying residents in the residents' minds, whether it be a pothole, a light that needs fixing, facilitating a meeting with MPD, um, jobs, we put them, we facilitate meetings and access to DDOE employees, staff, uh, when there's emergencies, sometimes burial assistance. We work with uh, different you know, agencies across the DC government to support our residents. Uh, everything under the sun that you can imagine. We don't legislate, we don't draft legislation, but we are a constituent service oriented organization. And uh, again, your office and Council Member Graham are, you know, are very experienced at that. And uh, so we, we follow those examples and, and we work hard again to uh, make sure we're serving everybody. Our biggest challenges are reaching seniors, the seniors of our city, because they're not on the, on, online. A lot of them are not online. So we depend a lot on our liaisons to be out at meetings, meeting with seniors, working with DCOA staff, Director Thompson. Um, we also want to get the youth engaged and involved in their government. It's, it's their future at stake, as you know. So we want to make sure that they are involved and engaged and know what we're doing. Um, and those are some of the challenges we have, you know, reaching those communities and immigrants, of course. And we get a lot of help from Director Ngazi Nemezi, from Director Roxana Olivas, uh, on those immigrant communities that you all have also supported historically. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we have continued to grow, continue to push hard. Yes, sir. Uh, this six billion dollar budget we have, and man knows that, and this is in parts of it. And the federal assistance program is another one. Yes, sir. I mean, it's outrageous that we got to scuffle around to get money. Mm. The uh, 
and her family had their old age. son that was killed. Yes. Sixteen year old Demetrius. And on the very day we were still trying to get money to bury not, not to bury but to have a spot to bury him. Yes. And this is country in the house. I don't make us cry. But then that's something you have a responsibility for. This is where the mayor comes in. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Initiative and the Convention on Women. Thank you, Dr. Lincoln, sir. Thank you. Take the oath. <clears throat> Do you swear or affirm on a penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give to this committee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um. Good afternoon, Mr. Berry, staff of the Committee on Workforce and Community Affairs, and members of the public. My name is Therese Lowry, and I'm Director of the Mayor's Office on Women's Policy and Executive Director of the District of Columbia Commission for Women. I am pleased to testify before you today on, uh, in support of Mayor Gray's fiscal year 2014 budget, which, as you've heard several times today, has continued growth across the District of Columbia and focuses on three main priorities growing and diversifying the economy, educating our children and preparing our workforce for the new economy, and improving the quality of life for all residents. Funds allocated for the Office of Women's Policy will support ongoing efforts in partnership with other district agencies and organizations across the city to advance our, to advance our mission, which is to facilitate an ongoing dialogue between community stakeholders and the Executive Office of the Mayor, which leads to social and political reforms, constructive programs and services, and in an exchange of information that truly empowers women and girls throughout the district to reach their full potential. I look forward to testifying in support of the mayor's budget uh, for the Office of Women's Policy and the District of Columbia Commission for Women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowry. Um, I'll ask you the same kind of question I asked others. What are some of the challenges that you face? Of, uh, your office. Sure. Um, one of the most significant challenges that we faced um, since the beginning of this administration has really been to revitalize the work of the Office of Women's Policy and the DC Commission for Women, which um, both of which had really been um, dormant for the last couple of years under the previous administration. Um, the mayor made a priority when he came in of making um, those boards and commissions that brought added value to the district um, active again so that we could really benefit from what the residents of the district have to offer and how they can improve district services. Um, and I'm proud to say that we've really been successful in doing that. Um, we have developed a full slate of activities on the Office of Women's Policy side that really speak to the needs um, of district women and girls, and we've appointed a full new membership on the District of Columbia Commission for Women, which um, really accurately represent 
What is the size of the commission? There's 21 members. Is it fully? It's it's fully appointed. Appointed. Yes. Who's the chair? I'm uh, Nona Richardson. And I know I've been asking for the public. Yeah, Nona Richardson is the chair. And in the future, I want the commission to be here. Okay. And the members to be here. Absolutely. And I want these members to be on the sideline and complaining about money and complaining about that. Mm -hmm. Because we, we're going in a different direction now. I expect these commissioners to be advocates of what we need. That's right. Recognizing fair. that you have only limited uh, authority to do that in the, at this table. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I know about you, you recognize the uh, reality. After I told Mr. Mr. King, the next budget hearing, I want all the commissioners to be here. I want the advocates, like the world the of African Affairs, mm -hmm. to be here and advocate strongly what you want to do to the money. And so uh, I'm going to be very, very supportive of all these kinds of things. That's appreciated. And so we, we're going to, you know, I, uh, I had a lot of experience with the commission. I, in fact, I think I was part of the council that set it up. Oh, yeah. But uh, during my mayoral days, I made sure that we had a strong commission. Mm -hmm. I don't mean chair. And, uh, wait a second. We had strong commissioners. Because women still catch an L on some mm -hmm. Still behind in pay equity. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, still behind in non discrimination mm -hmm. on women in government. One thing that I pride myself in doing, doing my administration, over 50% of my cabinet was females. Mm -hmm. Not in traditional jobs, mm -hmm. but non traditional jobs. For instance, when I came in in 78, financial revenue was loaded with white men at the top. Mm -hmm. And we finally were able to uh, get Kelvin Smith as the D.C. Treasurer, mm -hmm. the first in the history of this, 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 this city. And she went on to become, because I pushed, to become director mm -hmm. of tax revenue. Okay. If you look around the country as to who's making decisions about tax policies mm -hmm. about women and not black people. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. The other non-traditional was uh, in recreation. But uh, Alexis Robeson moved to recreation to head the OES. Did an incredible job. Then the finance control board came in and wanted to wreck everything. But we, 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 we were doing all right. Mm -hmm. And so advocacy of women ought to be and is the top of your agenda. Excellent. And you've done that personally. I think that the commissioners have need to do more to push this agenda. I mean, the mayor is committed to this agenda, but you know my attitude, you put your money where your mouth is, uh, no offense. Anything you want to add? No, I think you've said it all. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, sir. Hello, Miss Watson, the Taylor Student Fund. Rebecca Milano, Executive Director of the GEMA Gala. I tell you what, I'm going to put everybody's case. Who's out here? Can't expect me to push for things. You're not here. I mean, what? What? from the Office of General Affairs, Angela Franco, President of the River Washington Spring Chamber of Commerce. Welcome. Barlow Flores, Latin American Youth Center. Is he here? I'm telling everybody, I'm a new kind of chair. I expect the people who are leading to be here the whole time. Because, uh, of course, I'm getting paid, but I don't mind that. But I do get upset. It's my first budget hearing with these organizations. Not my first in terms of community affairs, my first in terms of combined committee. So you all put the message out there that this chair wants you to carry these budget messages. And that a lot of time in D.C. government, people come down to advocate. Uh, you ask them to come to a, a hearing, maybe long, no question about that. I expect the people to be here. If they can't do that, I'll quit. That's my attitude. So why don't we proceed ahead? Oh, Tina Swift Nelson. Mention time. Welcome. Good to see you again. Yeah. Everybody understand what I'm saying? This is not a one person show. We can't solve these problems by ourselves. The government can't meet all these challenges. It's going to take the full participation of the community some specific communities, but I'm going to insist that people fully participate, push for what you want to push for, and not just expect me to do it. All right? I'm all right. I need to. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and, and honorable council members. Uh, my name is Jaime Farron, and I serve as a U.S. Executive Director. We're here today to respectfully request the Council to fund the Office of Latino Affairs at the requested budget amount of $2.8 million so that OLAC can continue effectively serving D.C.'s Latino community, particularly in these historic times when our nation moves towards comprehensive immigration reform. I was a nonprofit organization founded that in 1973 that has helped immigrants from across the world overcome obstacles in order to succeed and thrive in the United States. This past year alone, we served individuals hailing from 108 different countries. 
As part of our efforts to fulfill our vision, we have served Washington, D.C. Latino residents since our founding, and together with Ola's support, have helped many of them succeed in the United States. In the past six months, Ola funded staff at Ayuda's Immigration Legal Unit, provided advice and counsel in 103 cases to low-income D.C. Latino immigrants by informing them of their rights under immigration law and explaining any and all available benefits and remedies for which they might qualify. One of those served with all our support was Robert. Originally from El Salvador, Robert came to Ayuda with a case manager from the Father McKenna Center for Homeless Men in Northwest DC. Robert needed help to apply for a work authorization and representation in deportation proceedings at the Arlington Immigration Court, after having worked previously with five immigration attorneys over the past 30 years. Robert had been in legal limbo in the United States for three decades after his first attorney improperly filed an asylum application for him. And a U.S. staff attorney evaluated his case and found that Robert was not only eligible for work authorization, but that he would be eligible to defend himself against deportation by applying for permanent residence through the Nicaraguan and Central American Relief Act. Since coming to Ayuda, Robert has successfully obtained work authorization, which after months of unemployment enabled him fi to find a job and obtain a DC driver's license. In addition, this last month, an immigration judge sought on behalf of Robert and granted him permanent residency. Today, with all our support, Robert now lives in an apartment of his own, is fully employed, and is no longer homeless. Together with Irma, we continue to work educating the Latino community on matters such as last year's announcement of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. We've done over 20 workshops over the past year and two legal clinics here in the district serving our <coughs> eligible youth for, to get a work permit so that they can work legally in the country. We're presently working with Irma to conduct an outreach event next April 30 to educate the Latino community on avoiding notario fraud. This is a widespread problem that, that occurs both locally and nationally, and with the prospects of comprehensive immigration reform, we want to work together so that our Latino sisters and brothers do not miss the opportunity to be on a path towards becoming citizens because of people who prey on the community and individuals desire to achieve certainty over their legal status. Ola plays an essential role in the life of DC's Latino community and does vital work as a community liaison and regularly works to connect various organizations and seeing that our Latino sisters and brothers are effectively served. We greatly value Roxana Livas' leadership and committed work as well as the services provided by everyone working at Ola. It is for these reasons that we respectfully request the council to see that Ola is adequately funded and staffed in this next fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me say that going next year's uh, budget after this budget cycle, I'm going to insist, first of all, let me commend you, uh, commend you very much for what you've been able to do over the years, but in terms of advocacy, we're going to start on the front end next year. We we'll tell the mayor what all we need without fear, without anything. I think some of us have just gotten into the mode of reacting to the mayor statement asking the council to fix it i'm going to fix a lot of this this year a lot of it there's no reason that the office of general affairs should not have more money that can fund organizations like ayuda and others that can help immigrants maneuver this crazy system around us and so uh, uh what are some of the challenges, uh, Mr. Brock? Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges? What are some of the challenges that you face in terms of your organization? It's a, a, ma a mainly challenge is serving the demand. Uh, we constantly, we've had in the past year, we were, we actually had a six-month waiting period for legal services at Ayuda for immigration. Uh, for example, just this past uh, How much money would it take? What's that? How much would it take to get that? Waiting this down to zero. Bob, if we, we've worked to reduce it by having our legal staff working overtime and, and extra hours, I, I, but with one lawyer at Ayuda, I, I, I asked you listen to the question. Okay. I said, what does it take to get that waiting list down to zero? We would need at least one, one staff person, which would be around $60,000 with That's all those need? benefits. Huh? That's all? That's all. All right. We'll probably add more because I have a better vision of it. All right. Thank you. But I'm tired 
of fighting these battles without the strong support of the leadership of the community. That's because you haven't gotten the habit into fighting, but no more. We're going to get something in this budget. We're going to get something in the supplemental. We're going to get something in the 14 budget. So just get ready for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to tell this all because it's time to be tough. It's for nothing. It's for nothing. Yeah, it's enough for. Yeah. It's all right. It's your name. So, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Councilman. Uh, yeah. I thank you for being a tireless champion for underrepresented and underserved communities. Um, with that being said, I'm here representing the Latino Student Fair, and it is an honor to testify on behalf of our grant maker, the DC Valley Office of Latino Affairs. The vision of the Latino Student Fund is for all Latino students um, to obtain the education that they need to succeed in life, to thrive in society, and achieve their dreams. Um, and we, our work is to ensure equal access to high quality educational opportunities for DC metro area Latino students in grades pre-K through 12th grade. OIL has provided continued critical support specifically for our Saturday tutoring program for the past 10 fiscal years. Some people might ask why it's so important to educate Latino students. First of all, I believe it is their basic right. Second of all, according to US Census data, um, Hispanics and Latinos are the fastest growing demographic group uh, in the United States. Um, and they also have the highest school dropout rates of any minority group. Um, when you consider those statistics, uh, education attainment for Latino students is a national concern. Now, we have identified and our clients have expressed the following primary issues uh, that the Latino community faces. One are the rising numbers of students that fail to graduate from high school and pursue higher education. Two are um, a lack of bilingual systems and organizations in place um, that are catered to the needs of these students. And three is a lack of awareness on behalf of families um, regarding the resources available to them. Now, what the Latino Student Fund does is we provide uh, an academic support system catered to these families' language and cultural needs. And we wouldn't be able to do this work without OLA. Um, consider the accomplishments of the program since OLA has been our grant maker. Since 2004, student enrollment in the tutoring program has increased 433% and is now serving 135 students and has served 1,200 students since its inception. As compared to um, the 15% dropout rates nationally, 100% uh, of Latino Student Fund students have graduated from high school and entered college. Now, the tutoring program is very important because it serves low-income and at-risk students, the people that need a academic support the most. According to HUD standards, 96% of our families in the tutoring program live in low-income households. And also, they're at risk because, according to our data, 65% of our students are well below grade level in reading. 35% are well below grade level in math. Um, what we are able to provide is indiv individualized academic support for them throughout the year. And consider the results from the last fiscal year. On average, our students have improved in reading and math by 1.2 grade levels. And that's just from once a week tutoring. Now, consider what could be possible um, with an increased budget, considering the fact that um, all of our programs are free. 100% of our budget is contributed income. And if we were able to grow our programs, and if other organizations were able to do the same, even more Latino students um, would receive the academic support that they need. Now, what 
organizations like Latino Student Fund and AUDA are able to do are to help families navigate these systems and serve as advocates for themselves and their children, um, which is really important. Um, currently, our program has a wait list of 100 students, and we are at capacity both in terms of building space and in terms of our budget. Now, if we were able to increase our budget, we would be able to serve the the students in our community that are in desperate need of our support. I will leave you with a quote from one of our students, Jennifer. She will, of six children, she will be the first in her family to graduate from high school and enter college. She has big plans for herself and she recently told us that the tutoring program gives people with low opportunities really high possibilities and that's exactly what Ola has done for the Latino Student Fund. I thank you for considering our testimony and have a great day. Thank you very much. I want to commend you for all the hard work that you've done at the Latino uh, Student Fund. And as I said earlier, I'm going to do something about all these kinds of money. Thank you, sir. You know, your, your statistics almost parallel that of African American students from the income community. And we had to form the, the black and brown kind of coalition to do something about that. Uh, I'm going to have to take about a four or five minute break, but I'll be right back and get the other two people there. But again, I echo what I said earlier. I want people in the Latinos, Student Fund, and other places, not. I, I know how this works in this government than happened when I was here. People who get grants from the government are a little reluctant sometimes to come and talk about that. But I'm saying with this committee, I don't want any intimidation from anybody or any threats that you can't come and say what you really need. So give me a couple minutes here. I'll be right back. <coughs>
yesterday. We're back. It's a continuation of the budget oversight hearing for uh, Office of Latino Affairs. Uh, we're going to. Uh, who do we have? Who do we have? It's my. Who do we have? Mercado. Is that correct? Is she here? Is who? Catholic Charity. I will be speaking on behalf of Ms. Machado. She had to leave, um, but I have her testimony and uh, I'm speaking right. on her behalf. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Angela Franco, welcome. Yes. Good afternoon, Councilmember Barry and members of the Committee on Aging and Community Affairs. My name is Angela Franco, I'm President of C and CEO of the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation. I would like to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the performance hearing for the office of the budget hearing for the Office of Latino Affairs and for your support to the minorities for a long, long time. Over the past 37 years, the Chamber and its foundation has developed new programs and services to better serve the needs of the Hispanic business community, and we are extremely committed to continue to provide the services that will help us to succeed. Our mission is to help Hispanic businesses to grow, and we do this through education, networking, and advocacy. One of the programs, however, that we offer through the foundation for the Hispanic community is the Small Business Assistance Program, which my objective is fostering and increase the number of Latino entrepreneurs and also help the, ex help the existing small business to upgrade their operations. The goal for our system programs is to strengthen the economic opportunities of small businesses owners by improving and retaining existing small businesses, guiding startup entrepreneurs to begin and regard successful entrepreneurs, drawing more local customers who only stop uh, shop outside the area, and connecting businesses to certification opportunities. All of the above will contribute to a greater financial stability and integration of district residents. Thanks to Ola, we have been able to create a program that has helped small businesses in this neighborhood succeed. Many of these businesses need the continuation of a program that can help them achieve economic growth. With the 2011 goal, we supported over 500 Hispanic entrepreneurs with education and one-on-one -on -one assistance. Plus, we have the creation of 10 new, 10 new businesses in the district. Last year, our goal was cut in half, and we had to reduce hours of assistance that could have helped many additional businesses. The importance of Dora in our community is not only measured by the services it provides, but by the funding that it offers. The support that the foundation has received from Dora has been extremely useful for us to accomplish our goals and has made a positive impact on the Hispanic businesses in the area. Dora has, has been doing an excellent job with the milestone grants assigned by the mayor. However, we believe that with the fast growth of the Hispanic community in the District of Columbia, all its funding should also be increased according to the Latino population growth in the area and its needs. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present your testimony, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. So much uh, for that testimony. I'm very, very familiar, as you know, with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, when I was mayor, we supported that effort. I know. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of things. And so, are you a membership organization? We have two organizations. We have the Fund Six, that is the Chamber and the membership organization. We have 410 members. And we have the foundation. And through the foundation, we provide um, the technical assistance programs. Thank you. Well, we want to help you as much as we can to increase that membership. Thank uh, you. I have the same problem with the D.C. Chamber and others. Getting people who are going to receive uh, help uh, of being in the business that can get involved with this economic growth. The economic growth in this city has passed Latinos and African Americans. Particularly in Ward 7 and 8. The mayor bragged about this. There are 56 cranes in the air. 
in terms of Ward 8, there's never one crane. One crane out of the 56 cranes, which means that not only are we not getting buildings built and homes built, we're not getting jobs. And so I want to do all I can to enhance the amount of uh, technical support you can give and do a whole bunch of things. As you know, I have a very strong support in the Hispanic, Hispanic community, business community. Let me ask you this. Is that what other ways can the government assist the business community from what I, and that is, it doesn't have to be all the chamber. What else can we do to support this community? The government? Well, I think that part of that is revelation, and um, the other part is support for education. I found that um, the two biggest areas where businesses need help is access to contacts and education and access to capital. So I think that's the organizations that can provide those kind of assistance to uh, businesses that would be a great way that the government can help. What's the mechanism you think that gets that done? Should we increase the uh, grant making of OLA and that be an integral part of it? I think so. Okay, well, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. No question about that. You got that one without any uh, equivocation on my part. Thank you. You've been, sitting, you've been sitting there, you know the direction I'm going. You know, I'm going to correct as much as I can these inequities of the past. Now, the $6 billion budget is a part of it. That, that internal youth center, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, it has a seat here, and I think you ought to do it. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to deal with that. But I mean, you all support it. When I do these things, uh, it's going to be uh, against a lot of opposition, some opposition on the council. Mm -hmm. And I will give you the names of the people, talking with the chairman, who don't support these thrusts. But I also am confident we have seven other people on the council who will be very, very supportive. I can say now, Jim Graham is in the forefront of being supportive. Says it's a number of number of Hispanics live in uh, Ward 1. In what for? Mm -hmm. uh, Miss uh, Bowser is not quite there yet, but see, we have an excellent opportunity because there's an election coming up in 2014, and I'm putting on notice everybody who's running for mayor. They have to support these various communities, not lip service, but with money, and so they'll have an opportunity. When I put this money together, uh, which I'll share with you all before I do it how you do it. So keep on pushing, keep on struggling, keep on working. Thank, Thank you so much. Peter Smith Nelson, welcome again. Thank you, Councilman. Chairman Barry and members of the Committee on Workforce and Community Affairs, my name is Tina Smith Nelson. I'm the managing attorney with AARP Legal Counsel for the Elderly. I also supervise the attorneys in our Public Benefits and General Services Unit, the unit which utilizes funds from the Office of Latino Affairs. And thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of OLA. Legal Counsel for the Elderly is the primary legal services provider to low and moderate income residents of the District of Columbia who are 60 years and older. LCE champions the dignity and rights of D.C.'s most vulnerable seniors. Since 1975, we have provided vital legal and social work services at no cost to our neighbors in need. Grant funds from the Office of Latino Affairs, together with other funding we receive, allow us to improve the quality of life of senior Latino residents by providing assistance in a myriad of civil legal matters such as income maintenance, public benefits, and various consumer issues. For example, through the use of OLA funds, we submitted a grant a SNAP application for a client after determining that he qualified for food stamps. In the course of our representation, we discovered that the Economic Security Administration had previously approved him for benefits, but he had not received any of those. After our advocacy, the client received his monthly benefits and the back pay for benefits he should have received when he applied. We assisted another client with a private pension matter by assessing the effect that rolling over her private pension into an IRA would have on her disability benefits. After confirming that the rollover would not affect her long-term disability, we assisted the client with rollover process. 
Lastly, we assisted a client in submitting applications to Social Security, SNAP, and the Qualified Medicare Beneficiary Program. The applications were processed and the client is currently receiving all those benefits to which he is entitled. In addition to individual representation assisting clients in navigating through the government bureaucracy, OLA grant funds allow LCE to engage in outreach events and provide educational information to Latino elders and advertise our services and outreach events on Spanish language television broadcasts and in Spanish language newspapers. Without the financial assistance of OLA, we would not have such a broad and impactful reach into the Latino community. In, fis in fiscal in the FY 2012, OLA reduced its grant to LCE by 50% to $15,000 and maintained that level of funding in FY 13. This was not a judgment on the value of work that OLA places on LCE, but rather a continued reflection of the increase in the number of organizations seeking grants from OLA in these economically challenging times and their need to stretch limited dollars to serve as many Latino residents as possible. The financial support the Council allocates for the Office of Latino Affairs has a direct impact on LCE's ability to meet the legal needs of our low-income senior Latino clients. Stagnant or insufficient funds forces LCE to make difficult decisions on which Latino seniors we can represent with our limited financial resources. Whose Social Security benefits will we be maintain? Who will be able to receive an adequate level of care in their home through the waiver program? Who will have enough financial support to buy food for their family? These are tough decisions LCE does not have to consider with sufficient funding. As such, it is imperative that the Council increases the baseline funding of OLA, and we're asking for about a hundred, half a million dollars so that the agency can adequately administer grants to LCE and other community organizations and thus enable older Latino residents to live fully and thrive as they age. With help from OLA, LCE can serve Latino residents through direct legal representation and provide education information through outreach events. This support has never been more important than today as the economic picture continues to dim, especially for the growing low-income Latino population. Together we can ensure that this vulnerable population has adequate and effective means to addressing their legal needs. Certainly access to justice should not be reserved only for those who are financially able to afford it. You can help close the gap in justice to the, our senior Latino neighbors by adequately funding OLA, for they in turn will fund LCE and other worthy grantees that provide necessary and beneficial <coughs> services to the Latino community. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony, and I'd be happy to answer any of the questions that the Councilman has. Thank you very much, uh, Tina Smith Nelson. I appreciate your work and your endeavors. You heard me all morning say, it's a shame that organizations like yours, now just 600, that's $6 billion, but $6 billion, B I L L I O N. It's outrageous. And I participated in it because I just, you know, I, I just I caught up in the system. No more. Going forward, no more. I'm not going to be fearful of anything about doing this. What do you think would be a good number? that would assist you? Assist us personally, I'm going to double that, which Eula uh, asked for, and said if we could hire at least two new attorneys to um, handle clients, um, these this population of clients, that would be $120,000. I appreciate that, but I, would, I want all of us to start thinking bigger, because this need is so great yes. out there. Yes. It is so great. So you all just, I know what have you been used to fighting rear guard actions, trying to get to keep what you had, and sometimes you have it. But doing going forward, since I'm in a new uh, position to chair the whole workforce in this, and <coughs> I'm going to urge you to to just look larger, exactly. but that without being out of out of out of out of touch and out of tune. Exactly. Thing. And so I appreciate you. Okay, uh, I said earlier, who's the Catholic charity? My name is Sarah Uribe, and I'm waiting to... Wait a minute, wait a second, wait a minute. Where is Ms. Mercado? Ms. Mercado had to leave to attend to an emergency, but I have her testimony and willing to read it on her behalf. Well, I'm going to talk to you all about that, about these emergencies. I'm for that. 
but I want people to get involved deeply in advocating. You know, not just come to this table, but all along, during the year, we ought to be advocating, or be pushing. That's how this bureaucracy works. You know, don't depend on me alone. Now that you said that, so proceed. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Julieta Mancado. I represent Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Washington. For many years, Catholic Charities has worked in close partnership with the Mayor's Office of Latino Affairs to offer two programs, our pre-apprenticeship green construction training program and our building maintenance program. Catholic Charities pre-apprenticeship green construction program is an intense 12-week course targeting Hispanic and Latino adults who need marketable job skills. Since the program start in 2002, Ola Support has helped us serve 785 low-income, unemployed, and underemployed individuals through the, through the program. The curriculum offers the latest green construction techniques, English and math education, and the provision of industry-recognized certifications, as well as the basics of plumbing, electricity, and carpentry. 70% of construction program graduates secure employment or go into higher education, and 85% improve their English literacy. We are very proud to report that our construction program was recently grounded, granted its DC education license. Catholic Charities Building Maintenance Program annually equips 60 low-income, underemployed DC Latinos with the skills and knowledge needed to obtain competitive, stable employment in the building maintenance industry. In addition to skill training, the program provides opportunities for advancement within the building maintenance industry by offering EPA Technical Certification Test Preparation Course. This past year, the program averaged a 90% retention rate, graduating 65 students and 11 students in the advanced course achieved their EPA technician certification. Since its founding, OLA has provided critical funds that help these two programs operate. We stretch the funding further by creating and using a number of partnerships, maximizing the effect on students. Clark Construction has been a longtime supporter of the Green Construction Program and every year takes students to a current project for hands-on learning. They have also hired several graduates. David Johnston, one of the leading experts on green construction in the nation, flies from Colorado to teach several sessions to every class, donate, donating all of his time and expenses from Colorado to teach, donating his time and expenses. And the local Habitat for Humanity welcomes the class every Friday to apply the skills to the work site. Several other organizations partner with us to provide workshops and training activities. The building maintenance program's working relationships have landed employment for graduates with Archstone Smith, Clark Realty, Kettler, JBJ, Complete Building Services, Southern Management Company, and WMATA. The program also partners with the Latino Economic Development Corporation to support students interested in creating small businesses. OLA estimates nearly 30% of DC Latinos who are at least 25 years old have not completed ninth grade. Of the 13% of DC, DC residents who are Latino, over half of Spanish-speaking residents say they speak English not well. DC's poverty rate ranks third in the nation, and while white non-Hispanics face 8.5 poverty rate, the poverty rate for DC Latinos is nearly 15%. OLA's continued commitment to this vulnerable population is making a tangible difference in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. What was your name again? My name is Sara Uribe, reading on behalf of Julieta Machado. Thank you. You, you put your finger on something that I have been talking about all morning. Poverty. 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 There's a direct relationship between poverty and all these social ills that we face. Whether it's education, whether it's representation, whether it's immigration, whatever it is, poverty relates to that. And so we intend to not only tackle this situation, is push the D.C. government in doing something about reducing poverty. Give me an example in our TANF program, which is a welfare program. The only thing we're doing is assessing them. And we put them into uh, a job situation. It's minimum wage. Mm -hmm. You can't live on that. 
can't live on minimum wage. It's been estimated that a family of four needs at least $50,000 of income just to live moderately. You can't pay your rent on minimum wage. You can't invest, you can't save money on minimum wage because you don't have anything to save. And so I'm just, I'm putting this out here and uh, let people know that this chair and this committee is going to do some major things in these areas. We thank you for your leadership. And, you know, for instance, uh, we had a four hundred and seventeen million dollar deficit. I mean, surplus. Four hundred seventeen million. A hundred million of that is uh, reoccurring money that's there. But I intend to use this. I had a general counsel opinion. I can use it. I intend to get you all to support that effort. So that next year this time, you come with more success stories, more I think that happened for the good. And so I want to commend all of you all for your hard work, your diligence, and your advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to uh, have to take a break before Mr. Lewis comes. And Mr. King told me there's some rumbling from some veterans about not going forward. Well, I resent that. There's been nobody on this council any more strongly supportive of veterans and their organizations and their people. So I don't know, well, I do know it was, I want to say it in public. You're wrong about that. Well, okay, well, why don't you just, uh, you tell me you can't sit here all day for money? <laughs> tell me that. The what? Oh, okay. Well, we'll deal with that. Now, from now on, you tell my staff that you have an ADD situation, and we'll do all the accommodations for what it is. So you can get, you can get up and walk around, go downstairs, do what you want to do. But we're going to conduct this hearing in fairness, so... Garrett, from now on, if you find particular needs, I want to know about them. All right? So I apologize for that. But uh, Mr. King will get it, get it from me going forward. Yeah. That's right. I got it. Well, he should have told me that uh, in terms of your disability. Yeah. But I don't care whether he told you or not. You should ask him why. He wants to know. I don't need all that nonsense. He didn't tell me that. That's not his responsibility always to tell you. Your responsibility to ask is there any particular reason why you want to testify early. All right. Hey, Michael, what's happening? Mr. Mayor, what's going on? Everything. Good. Everything's everything? <laughs> We've got a recess for, I don't know, probably about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Be back. Mr. Levis, we'll have you there. Uh, one, one, thing, I don't know about, one thing about these D.C. government employees, they're getting paid while they sit here. They don't worry about it. All right? Thank you.
hearing uh, at uh, 325 around here this is budget season and I'm on several committees human services there's a hearing on uh, UDC by the committee of a whole so I'm trying to juggle all this around so people understand that uh, Miss Olivas for I'm not going to do Mr. Robach he should be here okay you, know, I'm, you, you tell him I will tell him uh, Ted, I, I don't want, what happened? I'm going to get sworn and get that way. Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of law the testimony you're about to give to this committee, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I, I do. do. Thank you. Before you get started, Mr. Lee, what, what happened to the commission? I'm out here. I will follow up with Roland to see what exactly why he wasn't here. Not about him, but about the rest of the commission. Mr. Mr. King told me he talked to you about trying to get out of the commission. Yes, I spoke to Mr. King yesterday afternoon, and I did notify some individuals to come today. So what happened? Some were here. Some of them did leave. Who, were you? Who from the commission was here? Well, I have Maria Corrales here. She's still here. Okay. Um, she stayed. I had Gus Ritieri in the morning. I had David Ramirez in the morning. Um, that's about it. So why did they leave? Some of them had appointments around 2 o'clock, so they had to leave. But I don't like that. I don't like the fact that uh, Mr. King didn't tell you earlier, because I talked to him about this early in the week or late last week, that one of these commissioners there, not just from uh, Ola, but from all the other offices. But also what I'm going to like to do is that you give the highlights of uh, your, your, your great work and then I would like for you to respond to some of the questions and discussions we had earlier. Okay. Uh, proceed. So would you like for me to read my testimony or just to answer the questions? No, I'd like for you to give a highlights of okay. it. Okay, absolutely. About five minutes. And uh, we'll enter the whole statement for the record. And I want to have dialogue with you about what you heard this morning in terms of what needs to be done. Okay. Recognizing that you can't venture, venture out way beyond where you are because you work for the mayor. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Emil. Um, good afternoon, Chairman, Mary and Barry, and members of the committee. Over the last few years, Ola has been able to achieve many accomplishments, and some of the most notable accomplishments include providing funding to over 55 Latino serving nonprofit organizations over the years. These funds have provided some of th services to thousands of Latinos in need. In the past few years, Ola has made several improvements to the grant management program, including the launch of an on-site evaluation process of grantees, serving grantee clients on the most effectiveness of programs, and the launch of an online application and reporting process. On the issue of language access, Ola has worked closely with the Office of Human Rights, the Office of Asian and African Affairs, to promote the understanding of language access within the government. During the summer of 2012, the LLA program organized a video interview training for the Summer Youth Employment Program students, who then utilized these skills to gather video interviews with DC residents. Ola has not only dealt with issues negatively impacting the Latino community, Every year, Ola has taken part in events to highlight the value of the Latino community in D.C. From annual celebrations of Hispanic Heritage Month to working with art groups like Gala Theater and Fiesta D.C. One of the most 
one of the things that gives us the most satisfaction in the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis with individual constituents. Every day, Latino residents come to our office seeking assistance in various manners, from the help to children's school to help finding housing, employment. We have connected hundreds of Latino residents to vital government resources that have allowed them to improve their lives within their families. In fiscal year 2014, Ola initiates will be to improve its grant monitoring and site program by enhancing the monitoring process and developing IT tools. Ola will further develop and most efficiently implement automatic reporting tools to improve the compliance and better performance of nonprofit organizations organizations currently receiving district government funds. This initiative will systematically identify grant-related issues, gather da data to formulate recommendations, and perform tailored technical assistance as needed by grantees. Monitoring includes detailed reviews of progress made on grantees' approved work plan, year-to-date expenses, compliance with DC regulations, identification of areas of improvement, and review of issues related to the grant or overall standing of the organization. In fiscal year 2014, OLA will continue to address the issue's highest priority to the Latino community. These include education, health, housing, and employment. OLA will able to maximize resources, increase effectiveness by partnering both with government and non-government organizations. As low organizations will cut, cut in funding, we will focus even more on becoming fundamental resources for those organizations by connecting them to networking and educational opportunities that will improve their effectiveness. In fiscal year 2014, we will continue to connect the Latino community to resources by partnering agencies to inform the community about available programs throughout through outreach events in the Latino community. I would also like to thank the hardworking team that I have on a daily, daily basis that contributed to the impact of OLA and the Latino population in the district. I am honored to serve as the Director of the Office of Latino Affairs, and I also look forward to working with you, Chairman Marion Barry, and the rest of the Council to continue working and improve the quality of life of the district Latino community. I thank you for the opportunity to present OLA's budget, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Let me, uh, as you know, I'm very supportive of the office and very supportive of you as the director of it. What I'd like to do is enter all that into the record, which you said. I'd like for you to respond to some of the comments you heard here today about the lack of funding. Uh, they, everybody commend, commend you, but then we get to beyond that, what's next? Right. Uh, so can you take a, a, a EULA, historic, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and all the rest of the agencies who said, generally speaking, this is not enough money. I think because of the past, we six years ago we had a large amount of money, I would say around $8 million, and that got cut in half. So we've been doing the past two years what we can with the money we do have. So the money we do have is $1.8 million to give out to grants, which is, it's not, the Latino community is growing tremendously, so, and their needs are growing tremendously. And so you see a lot of nonprofits suffering because we can't give them that money or we can't grant them that money because we don't have it. Well, I'm going to certainly work to do something about that. Uh, in terms of the fallout from this, you started talk a little bit about this, but a number of agencies funding has been cut. Also, the national government has cut funding from certain programs. So I guess your general statement is that you recognize mm -hmm. that. And without saying it, I know you would appreciate some increased funding. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Yeah, don't be timid. Mm -hmm. It's all right. But seriously, I've been around a long time. Mm -hmm. and I know how this works, so we'll just do all we can. But you got it. Tell your commissioners. I'm gonna tell them. Okay. They got to become visible, stronger advocates for what's needed. Absolutely. Now you can't do that as well because you work for the mayor, but they can. Absolutely. Okay. I will so relay that to them. Any final statements? Just thank you for creating the office and always supporting our community and especially this office. So thank you. Thank you very much.
All right. Office of Veterans Affairs. Can we proceed? Michael Syndrome is not here. He misses his place. Sister Bird had to go for a doctor's appointment, and I've known Sister for a long time. He's a strong advocate for this office and for veterans. Bill Walker. Michael and Matthew Augustus Lee. Now, Jerry's is gone. Arthur Johnson. Who is that? <coughs> Welcome uh, to all of you. And I've just indicated to Mr. King that we need to do a better job of knowing what your needs are when you get here. And so expect calls from him going forward. So when we come here, I'm not surprised at anything. I'm an advocate of this office. I'm an advocate of the director and everything. So Mr. Uh, Bill Walker, will you proceed? You have a written statement? Uh, yes, sir. I gave them ten copies. Uh, first of all, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I want to apologize to you and to Mr. King uh, open, openly um, for my compassion about veterans. All right. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the, this panel regarding the budget of the Office of Veterans Affairs. My name is Bill Walker, retired Navy veteran, president of WW3 Consulting, uh, also, uh, which is a small... How long was your service? My service was four and a half years. My lung collapsed, but I've been working with the Naval Sea Cadets as a public affairs officer. I what did you do when you were active duty? Well, I was initially in the dental field, and then I went into Special Forces search and rescue diver, and my lung collapsed. Did it collapse under a dive, or did it collapse later? What? No, working out, going through training. Training, okay. Yeah. See. Okay. Um, I'm a service disabled, uh, own small business that provide counseling services to disabled, homeless, and formerly incarcerated veterans with drug abuse and mental health related problems. In addition to counseling veterans, I serve as the public affairs officer, community outreach officer for the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps, which is a worldwide organization sponsored by the Navy and the Coast Guard for the purpose of providing leadership and maritime skills training to young people aged 13 to 17 in a drug and fr uh, alcohol free environment. I am here with Dr. Pass, a former district government employee who served as the first director of the D.C. Center for Workforce Development, the pr principal training agency for the district government employee in 1998. Dr. Pass created the center that is now called Workforce Development Administration located in uh, Department of Human Resources. Mr. Pass had to leave. Uh, I would like to deviate uh, from this. Um, uh, my spirit just tells me that I need to not give you any numbers, but to give you the reality of what's going on right now uh, with what we're doing. Um, and that is, I've invited Mr. Donnell L. Albert L. from Richmond, Virginia, who is here in the audience to my right. Uh, he served in the U.S. Army as an IT specialist for two years until he lost partial hearing and was given an honorable discharge. After leaving the service, he became depressed and began using drugs. Eventually, he ended up on the streets homelessness where he committed crimes to feed his addiction. Subsequently, he was arrested and sentenced to a federal penal institution in Virginia. Once released, he moved to D.C. where he became homeless again. I met him while he was homeless and have been sponsoring him now for over a year. During this period, he enrolled in a substance abuse certification program at Catholic University that he subsequently completed as he has now graduated from. He currently resides in the VA Center for Homeless Veterans and is completing his internship in substance abuse counseling in the VA Medical Center. 
Donnell is one of the success stories, but there are numerous persons like Donnell who are still homeless and living on the streets in Washington, D.C. What can we do here in the district to help these forgotten groups of veterans recover and find fulfilling place in the community to begin with? They need a safe, supportive place to live. Secondarily, and, and equally important, they need a team of professionals who understand and can address the issues that have been dis discussing with them here. I'd like to get right to the, uh, to the root of the matter here. Um, I'm putting together a home over in Northeast. No, give me uh, a summary of that, because I want to hear from uh, okay. the other gentleman, too, at some point. Okay. Um, Okay. I am presently encouraged in a, in, in a project to provide these kinds of services. Uh, our motto is it takes a community to bring a veteran home. It may, well, it may, I would like to describe just briefly what the project entails and why my hopes are, and what my hopes are for it. The name of it? Is it bringing a veteran home? Uh, no, sir. What it is is when they come home from prison. I know this about. What, what you, is there any organization that's advocating for them, or are you advocating for them, or what? I'm sure. Uh, in, in collaboration with the uh, Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs. There's a collaboration. Okay. Proceed. Okay. Very good. Um, through the help of the friends, I've located a building in Northeast East D.C. capable of housing 12 veterans with spaces set aside for diagnostic team, meetings, private and group therapy sessions, a dental office, and administrative office. Construction on this building is currently underway, utilizing a team of former veterans with building skills. Which is operated by the Veterans Affairs or would be operated by somebody else? Well, it will be in collaboration with my, my company and Veterans Affairs. Well, who would be the bottom line on this? Here's what happened in D.C. government. Uh -huh. If we're going to spend money that's needed, we have to have some focal place at some point. I have no problem with the collaboration, but I need to know who the bottom line is. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a collaboration bottom line. Um, it's hard to find that, but I'll talk about it later. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going, to, we're going to rush this along because Dr. Lyon is up. So uh, move on. Next person. Is it me? Yes. Yeah. My name is uh, Michael Augustus Lee. Matthew is my heavenly name. If it wasn't for the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the angel of the Lord, I wouldn't be here right now. Wait a minute, let me have a recess on this. I have to talk to uh, Helen Bond. Bonds. will be right back.
rush out of here in a couple, about five minutes. So let's try to. Right. You next. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Matthews. I've been well, a long time. Make it, make it brief and short. I'm very, very concerned with your health and your well-being. I pray to God you live to be 120, <laughs> 110, 100 easy, and 90 the minimum. I pray to God if there's anything I can do to try to help you to be healthier, stronger. I've been trying to be, I've been trying to work for you for the last 22 years, and I feel very, very honored to be speaking to you. And this is the first time after 22 years to speak with you face to face. And I want to thank you, Councilman Barry, from August 2004 to February 2011. I was in shelter for six years and five months. And sir, you the oh, you came to 801. You slept in the shelter with us. So I want to thank you for that. I truly want to thank you for that. And uh, truth be speak very quickly, over 6,000 soldiers have been killed in Iraq, Afghanistan. Over 40,000 have been wounded. Over 600 have lost arms, hands, legs, and feet. I've been trying to find out the last year how many have been blinded, how many have been paralyzed, how many have been severely burned, severely disabled. And I found out just a couple weeks ago from Congressman Senator Bernie Sanders over 8,000 veterans committed suicide last year. I don't understand why the President and the Vice President and the 100 Senators and the 435 Congress people haven't declared this a national tragedy. This is a time full of injustice, wrongdoing, unfairness, corruption. I can't imagine what it was like, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, but Councilman Barry, I feel very, very honored and humbled to be in your presence. Mr. Well, Mr. Lewis, I really have to uh, appreciate what you're saying. I, from the very beginning, was opposed to the war in Iraq. Opposed to the war in Afghanistan. We, there are a lot of reasons why, but just one main reason that we go preaching democracy abroad and we're not free here, but more than like, more importantly, we shouldn't be doing this to our people. So rest assured I'm going to be with you. Thank you, sir. Art Johnson. Well, good afternoon, uh, Council. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, again, good afternoon, uh, Councilman Barry. And I am from the capital city. My name is Art Johnson, and I'm from the Capital City Community uh, Development Corporation which is a unique veteran-based training service provider. Who runs that? Uh, it is myself and the other gentlemen who are over here. We are a, a group that have put this together, and we're working to establish this in our D.C. area. Can you quickly tell me what about so I can be supportive? Okay. Real quickly. Uh, what it is is that uh, we are looking at veterans, and we're offering um, – entrepreneurship training, we're offering certification, we're offering uh, anything to help them to get on their feet and to figure out which way they want to go when they transition out of the military. And the veterans who are already out there, we want to help them to uh, to get going and get jobs. No, we're not. And that's part of what we came here to talk about. We'll do that a little bit later. I'm supportive of anybody who's trying to help veterans. Right. I'm supportive of putting money in the budget to do that. So I, I apologize for having to go up to the UDC hearing. Mm -hmm. But we're, after I leave, talk more extensively to Mr. Garrett King, and then you can do that. Right. And when I come back, I'm going to take the director, and then I'm going to follow up from this point on, identifying money and okay. funds in this budget. Great. Thank you. Thank this, you this hearing is our recess. Thank you.
Okay. Don't say we What did you say about me? That we would. What? That was Thursday. <laughs> Reconvene. This is a busy season around here. I just left the UDC hearing. I'm going to drop by uh, Councilman Graham's hearing on human right, human services. So uh, I apologize to all of you for having to interrupt these situations, but it's just a busy season right now. At this point, I'd like to call Matthew Carey, Director of the Office of Veterans Affairs. And after that, we get uh, Agent Sipdala, Office of Human Rights Lab. Oh, no, not all is back. Not all, not all is back. Okay. All right. Do you swear or affirm? On a penalty of law, that the testimony that you are about to give to this committee is the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Sir. Mr. Carey, I'd like for you to enter your entire statement to the record, but summarize, and uh, we have a few questions, and we'll move on. Thank you, sir. I support this office fully. I support you fully. Thank you. It's just a question of time and uh, situations is here. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your support of our veterans and families in the city, of which there are estimated over 40,000. Um, we have made some progress, you'll be pleased to hear, with the homeless at risk veteran population. Um, we have delivered to a furniture through our program to 150 DC homeless vets and their families uh, last year. And uh, we hope to uh, get another round of these HUD-VASH vouchers, in which case we will provide furniture to these. Uh, to How many do we have now in terms of vouchers? Uh, we're about. expected to get 75 for uh, the community research, uh, the CRRC at Franklin Street, and I believe Pathways to Housing will be getting a f another 50. So we're looking at 125. How many do we have now, do you know? How many, how many have received vouchers in the city? I think uh, approximately 300. First of all, let, let me just commend all the veterans who have served us, served this country, and served Washington, D.C. They have been unflinching in their patriotism to this country and to this city. And I want to talk later about how we can do something more to show that tangible support for these veterans. Uh, many of them have come back with limbs lost, lives lost, eyesight lost, uh, trauma situations. And so I just want everybody to know of my deep commitment, and it's a deep commitment to the veterans community. So proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, some of the challenges for us for the end of fiscal year 13 and into fiscal year 14 uh, is affordable housing for our veterans in this city, uh, jobs, um, also dental health care, mental health care and other supportive services, women veterans issues, 
and uh, also military family issues. So those are some of the challenges for the office. And also to try to encourage veterans who don't necessarily want to go into a uh, white collar position or even a trade position to consider uh, small business ownership and entrepreneurship. Thank you. You want to add there uh, how many homeless and veterans we have? The last count, which is the point in time count that the Department of Housing and Urban Development does through the Interagency Council on Homelessness, had indicated about the 510 homeless vets. Those would be ones that were in the street or had just been transferred to shelters. I think I'll we'll look at that because I, I, I just know that they are, have been high in numbers and we've made a debt, but not a big debt. So look at it again so at least I don't know what the magnitude of the problem is. You don't know what it is you're going to do to solve it, but I'm going to work at it hard to add money to this budget for a number of programs that you're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, we're on a tight time schedule, but thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your commitment to come to the District of Columbia. And thank you. One question I have to ask. This has been on my agenda ever since. And that is, I understand that we need to have a staff person certified in order to get further funds. What's happened with that? Well, uh, not so much to certify it for federal funds, but to um, assist with um, actually pleading the disability claims and the upgrade for disability claims. We're already recognized as a state office of Veterans Affairs by the VA and DOD. So I have my veteran benefit specialist, Ms. Putman, today going through the final training uh, to get the certification and she'll be taking the exam uh, within the next two weeks that, to have that capability. Why did it take so long? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, it, um, this, is, this training program is being provided by the National Association of Veteran Advocates and this is a, uh, an organization of lawyers that have uh, devoted their time to representing veterans. So this is the, probably one of the best training programs in the I country. That, but why is it taking so long to get her in this training program? Uh, well, we, we have been able to, um, to use veteran service officers from other veteran service but organizations. Why is it taking so long? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, you, I think you better know that. But, but we it'll be rectified within two weeks. That's not my problem. My problem is why has this been on my agenda and the agenda of veterans and advocates all this time? Yeah, I hear. How long is the training? How long is the training? The training for this is a day and a half. It does something. Right. Anyway, you know how I feel about it. I think it's awful. I'm glad that we're getting it done. So Thank you, sir. You commit to what, what time frame to have this done? I'm hoping to have her pass, pass well. Give me a time. If she passes the exam, it'll be within two weeks. If she passes. Correct. What if she doesn't pass? Uh, then she'll have to take the test again. I want you to put this on the front burner. Okay. Your personal desk. All right. About getting this certification because the services that we have been getting them from other people coming in here. Oh, you know, that's, that's ridiculous. Thank you. Yes, sir. Office of, of uh, Aging and Pacific Island Affairs. I'm not a mission with this office. I established it by executive order from way back when. I went represented. Then we got it passed through legislation. For statutory, so I'd like to ask uh, I do, President, Women East American Community Service Center, come forward. Thank you. How are you, sir? Uh, let me ask, ask uh, Julie Koo to come in and be sworn in so we can get that done. Julie Koo. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm on a penalty of law 
that the testimony you're about to give to this community, committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin, sit, you sit down. Thank you. Um, before we begin, let me uh, congratulate Ms. Kuhn on doing it under very difficult circumstances. A good job. I intend to, again, ask you and others about what level of funding we need to get, 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 this, get this done. All right. Thank you. See. Should I start? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Council Chair, um, for letting uh, the Vietnamese American Community Service talk today. Yeah. And my name is Hien Vu, and I'm the president for the Vietnamese American Community Service Center, as, known as VACSC. I would like to present our agency's view on the work accomplishment and budget funding for the mayor's office of, for Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs of the District of Columbia. The VACSC, Vietnamese American Community Service Center, is a local organization committed to enhancing the life of the Vietnamese American in Washington, D.C., so that they fully integrate into the American society and become self-sufficient. Uh, the VACSC was founded to aid the needs of the underserved, limited English proficient Vietnamese community. For FY uh, 2013, VACSC has received a small community grant funding from OAPAIs, which helped VACSC system its presence to help community members develop jobs and careers by coordinating or referring community members who want to open small businesses or obtain jobs licenses. With the continuance of the OAPAIs community grant funding, VACSC can continue to serve the pressing social services, legal, legal, employment, and housing needs for over 350 community members and an average of 750 visits or contact uh, to the office during the year. With system support from the OAPAIs, this number will continue to increase and we can continue to expand our assistance to the Vietnamese community. But at the present time, um, VACSC uh, uh, have a problem with office space to run a successful program as this year VACSC has to close its two program as we don't have enough space to operate a healthy and successful program. We ask the council today to help us find an adequate and affordable space in Columbia Heights where most of Vietnamese constituents live so we can continue to serve this community in need. <coughs> VACSC would like to thank the OPAI for their great support and appreciate the many sponsored community workshops and fair to strengthen, uh, to strengthen the bonds between APIs, community members, and their government. Those workshops and fairs such as in health, housing, jobs, and business geared toward the advancement of the APIs community. Um, once again, on behalf of the VACSC and the Vietnamese, we hope the o OAPI's community grant funding will be increased for FY14 in order to help many community-based organizations in need of funding to enrich the community they serve with quality service. Thank you, uh, Council Chair, to give me this opportunity to lend our voice on the budget hearing of the Mayor's Office on Asian Pacific Islander Affairs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ruth. Thank you for your service and your observation. As you heard me say earlier, we intend to identify funds to increase the work of this office. And I'd like to thank you. Uh, Ms. Koo, yes. are you ready? Do uh, you have a prayer statement? Did you summarize? Absolutely, sir. Right. Uh, ten minutes, what you have here. Let me just say that I have always supported this office Thank and support you. you. Thank you, so, sir. So uh, we'll enter the full statement into the record. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Barry and uh, Mr. King. I'm Julie Suyong Gu, the Director of the Office on Asian and Pacific Island Affairs. I'm pleased to testify before you today in support of Mayor Gray's fiscal year 
2014 budget and present OAPI's fiscal year 2014 proposed budget. In fiscal year 2014, OAPIA will build upon the successes in previous years to provide opportunities for the district's Asian American and Pacific Islander residents and merchants to be a part of the civic, economic, and cultural life of the district. OAPIA will accomplish this goal while reducing cost and improving the efficiency of its programs. This testimony will highlight our cost-saving initiatives and our efforts in educating children and preparing the workforce for a new economy and improving the quality of life for the residents we serve. The mission of OAPIA is to improve quality of life up for the District Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders through advocacy and engagement. Many of the OAPIA residents we serve are some of the most vulnerable residents in the district. They face financial hardships compounded with linguistic and cultural isolation in American life. To this end, OAPI currently provide three core services. One, assist the district's AAPI community in accessing equitable services from district agencies and advocate on behalf of the district AAPIs on issues affecting their quality of life. Two, assist DC agencies to build their capacity to provide culturally and linguistically competent services for DC AAPIs, and three, provide API community-focused grants. OAPI organizes and facilitates programs on public safety, human rights, economic development, housing, employment, social services, public health, transportation, education, mental health, environmental awareness, and multicultural development to ensure accessibility to government services for the district's AAPI community. In the District of Columbia, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are comprised of several ethnic groups from many different countries. According to the latest census numbers, the population grew to 27,444, or 4% of the entire district's population in 2011. This was a 66% increase from 2000 and a 2% increase from 2010. The largest ethnic groups reported in 2011 were Asian Indian, followed by Chinese, Korean, Filipino, Vietnamese, and Japanese. According to the latest census numbers, 53% of DC AAPIs are foreign born, compared to only 13% of the district's entire population. Only 39.3% of DC AAPIs own a house, compared to 42.7% of the entire population. Within the API population, 14.7% are limited English proficient, compared to 4.2% of the entire district's population. In fiscal year 2014, we proposed a baseline budget of $784,382, which is a slight increase of $5,214 from the FY 2014 approved budget in local funds. This increase accounts for the fringe benefit growth rate adjustment and consumer price index factor. This increase in our personal service is to support step increases and corresponding fringe benefits. An adjustment was made in subsidies and transfers in API programs to offset the personal service budget increase. I'm not getting toward the detail of the numbers. Uh, in fiscal year 2014, OAPIA will implement cost-saving initiatives similar to those implemented in 2014. 2013 through a variety of strategies, including one, improving and increasing partnerships with district government agencies and community organizations. Mr. Mr. Liz, let's enter the form, uh, statement into the record and thank you for your presentation. You have opportunity later to let the world know what you're doing. Uh, we support you very much so. Thank you, sir. We're going to look at additional funding for this office, too. So, uh, one question I have. Yep. There's a staff assistant position that's been vacant for some time. What happened with that? It's been already filled. Oh, yeah? Yes. Through a non competitive um, appointment. How did, how did that work? Um, so, we have an intern who was really qualified. So, we went through a, a process called a non competitive appointment which is because for her grade level, we can actually go through a non-competitive process. Well, it's, it's a term to service, term for 13 months. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay.
the Office of Human Rights and the Commission? Let me explain very clearly the situation with Michael Syndrome. I respect greatly free speech. I respect the rights of people to disagree with us on the council. But I'm not going to take disrespect. We're not going to do that. And so I'm going to uh, write to the chairman after Mr. Syndrome be barred from this building as he was before. Uh, he's been barred several times. But we don't have time for shenanigans and other kind of stuff. And serious as this is. Thank you all very much. Okay. I have two witnesses. Ronald Wade and Geraldine Tyler Henderson. Okay, Ronald Wade. You're not here? Also, uh, Geraldine Tyler Hobby. Not here. And let me say publicly, I'm going to be on the case of these commissioners and witnesses because particular commission members, they ought to be here. This is a testimony. This is the attitude and the atmosphere that's here. So at that point, let's raise uh, David Simmons, Chief Administrative Law Judge, and uh, Velasquez. And it was called the money they got in work much. Me to start, Mr. Chair. Do you swear or affirm on a penalty of law the testimony you're about to give to this committee is the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. do. Thank you. David Simmons, first. Okay. Mr. Chairman, let me apologize for the members of the Commission on Human Rights not being here. That was a, a mistake of staff. Had, had they, that been adequately communicated to them? that a mistake? Well, I, I'm responsible. No, I have a mistake. mistake. You said staff. Who made it? Well, I, I, yeah. I, I'm the person in charge of, of the Commission. I did not Mr. communicate Simmons, you know that. Me. I'm not interested in that. I want to know who on the staff made the mistake. Somebody. Well, remember you're sworn now. Who on the staff made that mistake? I, I just found out about today All right. that it was desired that they be here. And I'm saying I should have been more vigilant. You didn't know before? No, I did not know before. What did you tell them? Huh? When did I talk to you about this? Oh. We're not talking about this. I talked to you about it before now, so we'll get that straight. I'm sorry about that. Okay, no, but, but I, I will make sure in the future. I know you will. I understand the desire, and they, they will be here. It's a very energetic group. And Mr. King understands it, too. Okay. And so, therefore, we're going to have this problem again. Okay. Because there are people who are willing to serve, want to serve, 
would be here. Yes. And so, you can't tell people at the last minute that they ought to be here. So you see, summarize your statement because I'm going to have to move on okay. fast. Uh, quickly to, to tell you three things. Um, historically, our budget has been included within the Office of Human Rights budget, and so Director of Alaska's will really speak to that. Uh, we do have a new and energetic uh, commissioners. There were 13 commissioners appointed last spring. They have been very energetic and active. In the future, you will hear greater input from them with respect to the budget process. You, you know, as an administrative entity, we have to go through the mayor's office and that budgeting process. But we will make sure that that input is made and it, it comes you know, up to this uh, council in, in the proper manner. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, achievements, uh, in FY12, we completed nine commission cases, seven Office of Human Rights cases, and 46 criminal background check cases. We also conducted educational activities uh, in which we recognized the 1977 City Council um, as part of the 35th anniversary of the enactment of the D.C. Human Rights Act. Uh, we were able to have uh, uh, five of the living uh, city council members from that council actually uh, attend the event. We also had representatives of the, the other members um, that, that were there. We had 300 youth that we educated about the uh, D.C. Human Rights Act and I think you, you recall at the last... Yes, sir. Let me get this straight. Yes, sir. Come in here and get him out of, out of here. No, I'm not playing about this. We're going to have some decorum. George, you understand that? I do. I'm for freedom of speech, but I'm not for disrespect, and et cetera. And Michael, I've had this run in a long time uh, in terms of your proceeding. Okay. I was just pointing out, uh, we've run for the last two years a Youth Human Rights Ambassador Program. Wait a second. Do you call it a Tell him we're not waiting. I'm sorry. Okay. As part of the Youth Human Rights Ambassador Program, we've worked in 14 uh, city high schools in training over 300 youth about the D.C. Human Rights Act and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What yeah. other schools have you been in? Pardon me? What, what schools have you been in? Um, Baloo. Yes, off the top. Yeah. Baloo, Thurgood Marshall, um, Dunbar. Spingarn, um, Banneker, Duke Ellington, um, those are the ones that... How are those students chosen for training? These are students who are affiliated with the Georgetown University Street Law Program. Okay. And so there are actual law students who teach the classes in the school. So we teach the law students about the act. The law students then go out and work with the, the youth and teach them about the Human Rights Act and the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights. Okay. 
Right, right. And then I think you, you will recall in February we had played the uh, song that was produced by one of the, the, the students, um, uh, young lady from the uh, School Without Walls. Mr. Rich, uh, Chief yeah. Judge, there's been a lot of discussion about the office itself not certifying proper cause enough. I want to look at that uh, before we decide on the budget situation because the other thing I want to do is that there are not busy government employees who are not aware. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Barry. Um, I'm Gustavo Velasquez, Director of the DC Office of Human Rights, and I am pleased to testify before you today in support of Mayor Gray's fiscal year 2014 budget for OHR. I'm going to just summarize uh, for the record, uh, for the record, 
for the community and for the people who are watching us. Yes, just just for the record, Chairman Barry, um, the budget request for the Office of Human Rights is uh, almost 2.7 million dollars. This represents an increase of almost 11 percent from the prior fiscal year 2013. The budget is divided by the great majority being local appropriated funds, 2.4 million dollars. Uh, which is an increase of 9% and $307,000 for federal funds, which is a, a good increase of almost 26% because of an increase in the number of cases that uh, we are investigating under federal law, which uh, uh, we get revenue from both EEOC if it's an employment case and HOT if it's a fair housing case. Uh, that's pretty much it. I wanted to just give you the, uh, the amounts. Um, that the mayor is proposing in his budget for OHR. I want to thank you for uh, all your support to this office, to the commission, uh, and for your steadfast uh, advocacy uh, on behalf of uh, civil rights and civil liberties for everybody here in the district. Thank you. How many cases were filed in 2012, and how many of them were found not to have probable cause? I don't have the exact number with me. Okay. Um, I'm going to estimate about 350 cases, and uh, our probable cause rate has increased from prior years, some, somewhere between 5 and 7 percent, where I think up to about 13 percent now of, of all the, uh, the, the case load that we have. Uh, well, all this is good to have more cases. Now, you had an authority to initiate cases, right? That's correct. We'll talk about that later. Yes. But uh, we want to make this office, not your fault, the most vigorous office in terms of citizens having faith and confidence that we can overhead on those complaints. There's discrimination everywhere. I know it is. Housing, jobs, etc. Turning citizens, age, discrimination. I have a case right now with uh, a lady who lives in Ward 7 who's about 80, maybe 75 years of age, have had her, I think, well, she's had her grant, wherever she gets it from, cut off completely. Mm. And she's without any money, any means. And so I'm going to do something about that. It might not affect you, but I'll find a way to get that, get that, get that done. Sorry about the rush, but I have to uh, go to another hearing for a minute, and I have to go... Uh, I'm Southeast for well, two minutes, so uh, thank you all. Huh? I'm just going to have a pretty good minute. Thank you all very, very thank much. Thank you, Chairman. Well, we're just going to have you just to take about two or three minutes to come to welcome you. Uh, I know you had a funeral earlier. I know of your father's work. I know of your work. Yeah. yeah. All right. Do you swear uh, on the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give to the committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you.
You read the entire statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and members of the Committee on Workforce and Community Affairs and staff, let me uh, thank you for uh, replacing me on the agenda uh, and accommodating my funeral today. And um, thank you for uh, your commendation for um, Officer Captain Greg Thomas, who is very active in, in your ward, as, as you know. Uh, I'm pleased to testify before you today on Mayor Gray's fiscal year uh, 214 budget uh, to support the continued growth of District of Columbia. Uh, thank you. Mayor Gray's uh, FY214 budget submission focuses on three priorities. They are growing and diversifying the economy, educating our children and preparing our workforce for a new economy, and improving the quality of life for all residents. While there are admittedly challenges which all the Office of Community Affairs officers face with regard to carrying out the missions and serving the constituencies we are asked to serve, I am pleased to report that for FY 2013, the Office of Religious Affairs is operating within its approved budget and expects to close out the fiscal year in compliance with uh, budget mandates. Um, that will summarize my, my testimony, uh, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working with you, uh, members of the Commission, and advancing the work which you envision when we proposed uh, the Commission's creation. This concludes my formal testimony. I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. No, 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 no. Uh, even my deep commitment to this office, I established this office. Absolutely. For the whole purpose of getting the faith-based community involved in the affairs of the community, more so. It's, uh, you know, it's great to have prayer meetings and great to have choir rehearsals, but we have to have a lot more than that. We have to do as Jesus said, Get into the, the byways, the highways of life, clothing the naked, feed the hungry, counsel them in prison. And I'm very delighted in terms of uh, World 8 faith based people. We just broke ground, no, we cut the ribbon at, uh, at uh, W. Roundtree Residency, mm -hmm. a 901 unit sponsored by Allen AME Church. Matthew Terrace, as you very well know. About Wisconsin and others, there are other projects on the on the drawing boards. What we find missing is knowledge by these pastors about the processes that you go through, mm -hmm. and also the tenacity that it takes to do this. So uh, I look forward to working with you and talking to you after this is over. But thank you for your service. Thank you for your support. Yeah. It's been an hour.